Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who have died in the last week, particularly Jack P. Nealon, beloved husband, father, son of U.S. District Judge William J. and Jean Nealon, brother of Judge Terrence Nealon, uncle and nephew, Thomas P. McLean, devoted husband, brother, uncle, Navy veteran of the Korean War, and Scranton firefighter for 25 years, Margaret Peggy Cosgrove Silner, loving mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, sister, aunt, and owner and operator of Silner's Cafe, and their dear families and many friends who suffered their loss. Also, please remember in your prayers City Controller Roseanne Novembrino, who was hospitalized last weekend. No sound. Roll call, please. Here. 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 Uh, dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third order. 3A, Controller's Report for the month ending October 31st, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, Agenda for the Zoning Hearing Board meeting to be held December 12th, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, Single Tax Office City Funds Distributed Comparison for 2012 to dash 2011. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, applications along with decisions rendered by the Zoning Hearing Board on Wednesday, November 21st, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, minutes of the Scranton Lackawanna Health and Welfare Authority's regular meeting held on October 18th, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3F, Tax Assessor's Report, results from appeals from hearing date October 24, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes this evening, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. Uh, before we continue with um, announcements this evening, I am going to call on our finance chair, Mr. Frank Joyce, to uh, present council amendments to the 2013 proposed operating budget. Okay. I'll pass out a copy of these. One to Jack, since he's not here, if you could pass these down. Of amendments that I would like to make to the budget Basically, I'd like to make these amendments in seventh order. I'd like to hear what, or I'd like to hear what the public has to say. And essentially, I'd like to eliminate all the raises that were um, given in the 2013 operating budget. This would be um, this would be taken out of the standard salary account for fire of 16,258.07 City Council 15,000. The BA's office, 20,000, HR, 10,000, law office, 15,000, 
And I'd also like to trim professional services in the city controller's office by 2,500 since they didn't make any cuts. This was basically for the single tax office audit. It's budgeted at $20,000. The Scranton School District is paying 17,500, which is half, so we should be paying the same. And also professional services in the law department, I'd like to trim off $15,000 to bring them at the level that they were at um, this year. And that's all. That's a total of 93758 And I'd like to reduce the current real estate tax by the same amount. And I'd like to do that in seventh order. And thank you, Mr. Joyce. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Um, just as a follow-up, um, I'm very glad to see that my colleagues also agree with taking out the raises. I actually have some amendments that are ready as well that I'll uh, have in fifth order as well. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Pennsylvania's Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP, is accepting applications for the program's helpful cash grants and crisis grants for the 2012-13 heating season. Cash grants are sent directly to the applicant's utility company, and crisis grants assist those who are in danger of immediately being without heat. For more information and income guidelines, call the LIHEAP hotline at 1-866-857-7092. Or contact State Senator Blake's office at 207 2881. The Scranton Civic Ballet Company, under the artistic direction of Ms. Helen Gauss, will present its 26th annual production of the holiday classic, The Nutcracker, tomorrow, December 7th at 7 30 p.m., and Sunday, December 9th at 2 p.m. at the Scranton Cultural Center. Admission is free. To obtain free reserved seating tickets, stop by the Cultural Center box office at 407 North Washington Avenue in Scranton or call the box office at 570-346-7369. It's a perfect way to usher in the holiday season. And uh, our council solicitor, Boyd Hughes, is unable to attend tonight's meeting. Um, he has had a number of health issues lately, and he's following doctor's orders, uh, eliminating some of the stress in his life, and he will not be with us this evening. But we hope he'll be able to return next week. Mrs. Evans, may I, I do have one announcement. Um, again, uh, Matthew's Mission, the third annual Breakfast with Santa, will be held this Saturday at Scranton High School. Uh, tickets are $9 per child and $12 per adult. To make reservations, um, please contact Kathleen Hakus at 961-0818. Um, it's not only a Breakfast with Santa, but they have raffles and entertainment. Um, it's, it's a great morning and a great cause. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else? This is, are we on announcements? Yes. I'm, so, I'm sorry I'm a little bit late, but uh, I do have one announcement. The Westside Falcons uh, Junior Football League uh, A team and C team will be playing in the national championships in Virginia next, uh, in two weeks, I believe it is. Uh, what they're, they're having a spaghetti, a pasta dinner benefit to help defray some of the costs. It'll be Monday, December 10th at the Villa Maria 2, 1610 Washburn Street. The tickets are $10 per person. Takeouts will be available beginning at 3.30 p.m. and a sit-down dinner from 5 to 8 p.m. There will be some surprise special guests. Uh, please help support the team where Penn State's Matt McGloin and the University of Pittsburgh's Hubie Graham learned how to play. And again, that's mon this Monday, December 10th, at the Villa Maria 2, um, from 5 till 8 p.m. And takeouts are available at 3.30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Crape? Fourth order, citizens' participation. Our first speaker tonight is Ron Elman.
Hello, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Jack, you're tardy. You get detentions. Yeah. <laughs> I'll sit in the corner later. <laughs> Boy, there's not many happy campers out there this week, I tell you. And we all know why. We, we live in a city that just, it seems like it's just going to collapse or something because of all the bad government choices year after year. You know, it, it just seems like Mr. Cross isn't doing very much to help the people of this city. He, he, he's just a failure. It's something else. We just need some, some. We need some good government. We haven't had any for the last ten years. But the, I know nobody's going to like this. But to me, our major problem is having. The University of Scranton here, Lackawanna College here, the medical school here, Marywood here, ARC and, and Goodwill, everybody is just taking and not giving one thing back. Mr. Zygmunt Braggs, he gave us a couple million dollars in 25 years, but he, he, he doesn't even want to think about the 20 or 30 times that that they've taken off our tax rolls and taken from our children going to school. The, the, the school system is what? It's, it's a second-rate school system anyway. It's not like it should be if we had the money that should be there. Mr. Joyce. Yes. I, I appreciate your knowledge in finance, so I'm going to ask you something. Where will we be, in your opinion, 10 years from now, if we're in the same position with this borrowing and this constant tax raising? Uh, it, it acts like, like people don't think we get taxed enough. They, want to, they just want to keep taxing us. I know your, your mama must want a lot of little babies to, to take care of. Where in the world, what kind of city are you going to give them? We'll, we'll just be out of control in, in the way things are going. This 12% you're talking about is just a drop in the bucket. I'll shut up. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Yeah. I, 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 the, the, these are just things that I think of. You know, they're what, what people bring up when I'm here and there and, and having a beer at the Taurus Club and so forth. But the, the, these nonprofits, nobody wants to acknowledge, you just don't want to address the fact you can't keep raising our taxes. They're, they're just. I think today, all the utilities, R Rendell gave the utilities a carte blank to do what they want. They're going up. I haven't filed any kind of claims. My car insurance keeps going up because of floods, they tell me. And my house insurance, when I bought the house 20 years ago, my insurance was 292 for a year. Now it's 1300 and some dollars. You know, you people got to re think that that's all over town. Everybody's expenses are, are at least double what they were. Uh, you're talking about 10 years from now, a city with 100-year-old houses. Uh, and rents would be outrageous the way taxes are going. I'm not blaming y'all. I'm just saying, this is what I hear. People can go to Archibald and, 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 and the communities around us for new properties that, that aren't as expensive. I don't know what the solution is, and, and I don't know what council can do. But uh, to me, these entities are nothing but an evil, and council has an uphill battle. I, I, I'm glad I'm not sitting there in one of your seats. I, I, th I thank you for giving me some time. I was waiting for you to say where we're going to be 10 years from. <laughs> it's tough to tell, hopefully in a better place than we are now.
<laughs> yeah. That's, that's true, but if we go up, I don't know what the percentage is, year after year, let's say you go up a couple percents, my, my taxes are, are they're, they're just almost double as when I bought my house 20 years ago. So in another, let's just say I'm still here in five years, I won't be able to afford it if I wanted it. A quarter or a third of the city is, is just not strong financially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Les Spindler. Good evening, Council. Les Spindler, city resident, homeowner, taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Well, I really don't have much to say tonight, Al, and I, I was going to speak about all these raises, which I said I was against last week, but I commend you, Councilman Joyce, for making these amendments to take those raises out. I don't think now is the time. Being that I see we have to borrow 21 million just to get us to the end of this month, and 25 million next year. And I think this is all due to mismanagement for the last 11 years. If Mayor Doherty negotiated with the firefighters 10 years ago, we wouldn't have to borrow 25 million dollars next year. So it's it's all the fault of Mr. Doherty, and it has to change next year. And uh, I was going to say, I know you have a meeting in front of three judges for the commuter tax Monday, correct? Next week. S next yeah. week. I, I don't, it's, uh, with those raises, I was going to say, I don't know how you could have gone ahead in front of these judges and asked for a commuter tax and still give these raises. So I'm glad that's off the table now. And uh, lastly, I, uh, I have a question from a commuter who works with me. The question is, uh, the uh, estimated commuter tax for next year is two and a half million, and then the 2014, 2015, it goes up to four million. Where did you come up with this figure? That was actually uh, those were actually Pell's figures. Um, what they project is that we'll only collect three quarters of the tax in the first year. Um, they say that uh, collections will be slower as well. Well, how do they come up with these figures? Do they know how many commuters we have that work in the city? There was a study done by the Institute uh, for Public Policy Development. Uh, I have a copy of it. I, I don't have it on me, actually. I have it at home. Where they identified the number of commuters working in the city, and they took the average salary of someone working in the city, and that's where they came up with the figure from. That, that amazes me. They know how many people that live out of the city to work here. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, lastly, I want to congratulate Matt McGloin on winning the Burlesworth Trophy as the best walk-on to get a scholarship, but it was well-deserved, and uh, he represented our city well. His parents should be very proud of him, and I uh, hope to see him here soon getting a proclamation. Okay, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Bolas. Good evening, Council. Bob Bola, Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, a couple things tonight I'd like to uh, kind of touch on. I think first on is this towing contract that the city's exploring. This evening, I parked a heavy wrecker outside, showing Council what it costs to be in the heavy duty towing and recovery business. You cannot expect the people who have been servicing this city for year after year after year and paid a fee here in light duty or medium duty to go out and spend like we have hundreds of thousands of dollars on heavy equipment to stay in the towing business. There are a few of us in this area that could bid the city contract. We could take it all and we could force every little towing guy right out of business. We all have that capabilities. Well, I, for one, would never get involved in it, number one. And I think Council's entertaining to give it to one person 
is like trying to feed the pig the whole pie. If I, if I could just clarify for a second, Mr. Bolas, um, giving it to one towing company was not the idea of city council. That was suggested to city council by Corporal Bachman. He felt it was the optimal way to address the situation. And I believe uh, Mrs. Craig can even attest to that because she was also present at these meetings. So it wasn't the brainchild of city council. No, I'm, I'm fully aware of that, Mrs. Evans. And the reason I'm bringing it up is during the Connors administration, that attempt was made. Connors had already had a check made up showing it in front of uh, a De Naples record that was going to take the contract. And we took a legal challenge to it, and it was defeated, and that was rescinded. And to this day, that still stands. So to turn around and say we're going to give it to one guy is wrong because you're unfair. I think also um, uh, that was discussed during the meeting as well. That contract, I believe, was for at least a term of 10 years. And I think what um, Corporal Bachman was suggesting was an annual bidding process so that no towing company uh, would have that advantage for a 10-year or a 5-year or a 3-year period. What? It's like any type of competition. Once you get it all, all the little competitors fade away. And the one individual just keeps sufficing because he has it all. So whether it's annual or it's five years, once you got it, it's not going away. So that's just plain common sense. It happens in all phases of the transportation industry. You could cut rates, you could raise rates after everybody else is gone. What I'm here to say is I'm here to defend the small guys. They've been servicing the city a long time. <clears throat> we would not, in all honesty, bid the whole city contract. And we have the capability to do that. It's just not fair to even think it would work. What the city should do is collect the storage fees. Because I don't think there's anything greater for a towing company out there, the biggest risk is not to get paid. You can tow a vehicle in, somebody doesn't come and get it, you're stuck. I'd rather tow the car in today, have the check in my hand. The city sets up a comp check or an EFS check, so when it's towed in, you're immediately paid for your tow bill. Well, actually, that's what was proposed. And I understand that, and that's why I'm here to explain to council, brought the example, that it just won't work. It'll be defeating to the city and to the businesses that have supported the city year after year after year. You can't force them out of business, no matter who suggests it. People come and go, no matter what part of the administrative part they are. So I would say let the city collect the storage fees, let the towers bring in the vehicle, and get paid on the spot. They got cash in the hand, better than bird in the bush. Okay, so I believe that would work to the betterment of everybody. And everybody eats instead of just one. And, you know, as I, as I said before, that was, um, that was the plan proposed, that the towers continue their towing operations and that the police department would operate the storage yard. And the towers would be paid for their tows by the, by the city. Right. Um, can I ask you, though, um, Mr. Bolas, you're a tower, obviously. Um, yep. How much of your towing business comes from the city of Scranton? We don't do anything in the city. The only time our wreckers come into the city, uh, even though I could set, establish what real estate and things I own in the city, uh, we're in Dunmore Troop area, the Poconos. We have seven locations throughout northeastern Pennsylvania. We only come into the city when a customer actually requests us to come here. Mm -hmm. And most incidents, uh, say for example, Jack broke down in the city. 
And the police came up and said, look, we're going to tow you. He goes, well, I have my own towing company I want to call. He has preference to have his car towed and not by somebody in the city or okay, on the city contract. Okay, so contract. in other words, he could opt to go off the towing list. Absolutely. I believe you're, you're not on the towing no, list. No, he could pick anybody he wants to tow his car. He could go AAA. He could be with Allstate. He could be with any one of a number of motor clubs. So there are a lot of options to the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time the city actually does a towing or the state police is if the individual does not have a preference for towing or it's blocking an intersection or a highway and it needs immediate removal or mm -hmm. an immediate response. I do think it, at the meeting it was discussed, uh, just like you said, the only case where that may not be appropriate would be if the vehicles are blocking traffic and their tower was coming from 15, 20 miles away. Exactly. And that, but and that happens on, that. on a daily basis. So what I'm trying to put, sure, Mr. Oh, I was going to, go ahead. Could I ask Mr. Bowles sure. a question? Uh, since you're uh, in the business, what percent of, you do store vehicles that you tow? Absolutely. What percent of those, just an estimate, are not reclaimed? Uh, I'd say maybe 10%, 20% could be that high. A lot of times insurance companies will say, oh, that tow bill is too high. You're keeping the truck and we're not going to pay you. You wind up in litigation, legal fees. You do run into that in a lot. Mm -hmm. Somebody but has then, no collision on a car, they'll tow it in. And if the car, though, um, is n remains unclaimed and the insurance company isn't going to pay for it, don't some of these vehicles then become salvage vehicles? Right. You have to have a salver basically dispose of it. And uh, certainly there's money involved in that transaction. Well, there's, a, there's costs no matter where you look at it, but you towed it in, you didn't get paid your towing, you didn't get paid your storage, you may have the vehicle, you got to get a salver, you got to go through a whole bunch of nonsense to get rid of it, and you probably lose more money than you would have gained. In this instance, it's a benefit, literally, because no one should just rely on being a towing company. You want to have other things because you want to have repairs, you want to have maybe a body shop that you have and you tow to that you can get the repairs. In this case, the beauty part is you got your money up front. You're not waiting 30 days or 60 days or a week and you're not dealing with a car that there is no insurance. Remember, not everybody carries collision or comprehensive insurance. They just put liability on, the car gets wrecked, you keep it. So the beauty part for the guy towing it is, he's getting paid. He doesn't have to worry about what's going to happen to the car later. Plus he has first contact with the owners to sit there and suggest that maybe they contact him to repair the car, to do other things, or tow the car somewhere else. So there's a lot of different things that come into play in this. Once the city has it, it's the city's responsibility to collect the storage. If they can't collect storage or whatever, they have to go through the process to dispose of it. And if they dispose of it, they're still going to have to call a tower to remove it to wherever they're going to dispose it. Or the company they're disposing it to, the junkyards or whatever, will come and pick it up without any cost to the city. But it's more of a win-win situation. I prefer to get my money today they wonder if I'm going to get it tomorrow or the next day and the next day on. Thank you. Okay, but I have more to talk about, so <laughs> if I could take another minute or two. A minute. If I could, please. Uh, I have a big issue with the commuter tax. I don't think the city has explored all the avenues, the fees and different things that could be implemented, the sale of real estate, a lot of other things here before we ask people outside the area to pay for what's happened in the past. So I would ask council to really get rid of that. I think it's going to hurt us more than it's going to help us. And if they start hitting us with fees going into their communities, we lose all over the place. The next part was the leachate line. That's a fee. That's an example of income coming in that hasn't been explored. It hasn't been assessed. 
and there's millions of dollars out there. Keep in mind, this landfill takes in a thousand tons a day of shale coming in there now that they're treating. There's a lot of liquid being involved in there now in the treating of this. It's all going into the leachate, so that's much more affluent coming into the sewage treatment plant that we could be making millions of dollars uh, just by being a host community. So these are things that you need to explore to where we're going. And last, <clears throat> that uh, I would like to bring up, and I brought it up with our attorney last week when we were here, regarding this machine that's been impounded by the city of Scranton. The police department have this impounded. Right now, the rental fee on it is over $30,000. Now here's a city that has no money, begging people to pay the commuter tax or pay this or raise taxes. There's over 30,000, not counting the removal fees that we have no idea what they cost to remove this machine when everybody's fully aware who, what, when, and where about the machine is still being impounded. And this is something I think council needs to look into before we ask somebody else to pay while we're squandering money <clears throat> needlessly. For what purpose? Um, not to disagree with you, <clears throat> Mr. Bullis, but council is a, a legislative body. And uh, really, it's beyond our scope of authority to tell the police department to uh, release something from its impound or to tell the district attorney well, to... We're not, we're, I'm not asking council to do that. The processes will take place, whatever the process is that we're in. I'm just raising issues because you are a legislative body that when people come begging for money and they're not paying attention to where it's coming from is what council has to make the administration aware because it is the administrative problem to govern their own people, and I understand that fully. But I'm making council aware that this has cost the money, so before we ask people to pay a commuter tax, let's clean up our own house first. And that's what we've been trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and Thank incidentally, you. I did meet with Cosmos that had a problem on Mosley Street because of the bridge closing, and we're coming up with other solutions that hopefully PennDOT will listen to uh, alleviate the hardship on some of the people. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Evans, um, before the next speaker, and maybe I'm confused from what Mr. Bowles said and what you were saying back and forth, is the city going to pay the towers when they drop off a vehicle at the city lot? Uh, I don't know if it's paid immediately, but the city will be paying the towers. Okay. And the question is if, you know, in the 20% scenario where the car isn't picked up, where would the money come from then? The city can, I glanced at it, it was an 80 some page document, the, Sal, the Pennsylvania State Salvers Guide, mm -hmm. and the city cannot become a salver, so I envision you know, cars piling up, and I don't know how we would have the money to pay the towers then. Uh, I think in those cases, even though the city is not a salver, the city can certainly do what the towers do, which is uh, selling the car to the salvage yards. Mm -hmm. And then out of that money, the tower would be paid. All right. I just wanted to address that now because Mr. Bolles was bringing it up. And if I may, Mrs. Evans, one of the solutions for the city in that situation would be to auction them off. They Thank you. They don't have to worry about being a salver or anything else. So you can auction them off and be sold that way. Thank you. And, and I'll comment more on this under motions. I just wanted to bring that one point up now. Thank you. Doug Miller? Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Good evening. Good Just evening. again to uh, once again go over the budget. Uh, probably going to sound repetitive with a lot of my statements again. But uh, I again appreciate all the time and effort that has been put into the uh, budget process, uh, particularly by Mrs. Evans, uh, Mr. Joyce, our finance chair, and uh, Mr. Loscom, our public safety chair. Uh, as we look at that, you know, they weren't easy decisions to make. Uh, there was a lot of uh, difficult decisions to make along the way. We understand the situation we're in. Uh, raising taxes certainly isn't something we look to do every year, uh, but due to the, the fiscal mismanagement that we've had to deal with for a decade, uh, put us in a tough spot. And you know it's unfortunate to have to place the burden on the taxpayers, but I think the taxpayers need to know full well that the council did everything they possibly could to alleviate the burden. 
where it could have been a lot worse. I mean, you know, we go down and we take a look at some of our surrounding cities, such as Wilkes-Barre, who I believe is raising their taxes over 30 percent. They just laid off 11 firemen. Hazleton, I believe, is looking over an 80 percent tax increase. So you see that it's happening everywhere, that cities all over are struggling and are dealing with difficult situations. Um, and, you know, it just goes to show the mismanagement here in the city that we've continued to let it happen. And, and ultimately, the voters of this city are responsible for all of it because they, they ultimately let it happen by consistently, time and time again, coming out and voting for this same individual to run the city. And they didn't learn their lesson the first time. So at some, sometimes I do have a difficult time having sympathy for the voters because they did it to themselves, in essence. And, you know, Monday night's attendance certainly said it all to me. Uh, there was no excuse for it. You know, we're in a city that's dying right now, and we're looking for all the answers and all the solutions at this time. And the lack of attendance here certainly upset me very much, as, you know, we have all these hundreds and thousands of people across the city who are fr so-called frustrated, and yet you don't see them here every week. You know, they may occasionally write a letter to the editor or whatever they do, but they don't come here. And that really bothers me, because I consistently come here, other dedicated people come here and voice their opinions, and want to see the city move forward. And then I ask myself, you know, if you're not willing to help yourself, then why should we come down here and help you? You need to get up off the couch, quit being lazy, quit feeling sorry for yourself, and get involved. There's no excuses. You know, the old, oh, we don't want to get involved with politics, we need to watch out. You know, people are afraid that they're going to, you know, bother the wrong person. I don't buy that. There's no justification for it. This is our city. We need to take it back. And it starts by making changes next year to move the city forward. We have a long way to go, but if we didn't take the action that we took now, we'd be looking at bankruptcy. And bankruptcy is not the solution. It never will be. Municipal bankruptcy does not solve anything. It takes matters out of our hands and into the hands of people who won't care. That you'd be looking at tax increases that would be astronomical, and we wouldn't have a say over it. They would it'd be a complete takeover. People think that it would wipe out contracts and it would do this and wipe out all our bills. No, it does none of that. You need to take a look at it. It's not the answer. It's not the way to go. We need to make the decisions now to avoid that. And I'm confident that for the years to come, with the decisions we've made, it'll end up being in the best interest of the city. But that brings me into the forensic audit, and I did bring that up on Monday, and I'm hopeful that it will be addressed later on. I know it was in discussion this past summer with the recovery plan. I believe that that forensic audit needs to take place. We need to get a firm grasp of where we truly are financially, account for every dime, every penny that's been spent by this administration, and then we'll get a clear-cut answer of where we really are. But it's really hard to move forward without that audit. We need that. That's the blueprint to find out where we're at, and I'm hopeful that that'll be a part of uh, our agenda moving forward. Um, you know, earlier tonight, you know, Mr. Joyce presented a few of the amendments uh, to eliminate all the raises. You know, I certainly respect uh, those amendments, um, even though I'm sh there may have been some individuals, such as Attorney Hughes, who should have been rewarded or may have been entitled to those raises for his work he's done. But at the same time, we also understand the tough financial situation we're in, and we can't afford to take that on at this time. But those individuals still should be commended for all of their hard work and effort and the things they've done to help the city and help the council make the difficult decisions with the recovery plan, the budget, and the parking authority. Professional services, cuts that should be made. You know, we look at the millions of dollars that we've squandered over the last 12 years in professional service fees. The individuals like Carl Greco, who we've never gotten anything in return. It was more of just playing the, uh, the crony game and giving out contracts to, to those who support our campaigns and caused a lot of problems. But, you know, just in conclusion, once again, I commend you for all you've done. I do appreciate all those that come up here and offer input and solutions, and I'm quite confident that the city does have a bright future, and it's going to take time. There is light at the end of this tunnel. It's going to take quite a while. You know, you think of the fact that it took this long to get in the situation we're in. It may take just as long to get out of it, or maybe even more. But I'm confident, and I'm not going to give up, and I encourage everyone else not to give up. But get up here. Get involved, because this is our city, and we need to take it back. There's no excuse for sitting back and sitting at home and doing nothing. This is your town, too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And Lee Morgan. Good evening, Council. 
Good evening. Good evening. Um, at this time, I'm not going to address the towing issue because I, th I just think we should have some legislation in front of us before we try to determine what's taking place. But um, I believe if everybody read the newspaper today, they'd hope that uh, when this case goes to court allegedly on Tuesday for the commuter tax, that uh, the court will have the wisdom to uh, not allow the city to implement it. Um, a remarkable thing, the Scranton Times did an editorial today talking about Harrisburg and how the legislature itself allegedly has made it illegal for the city of Harrisburg to, to uh, create a commuter tax because they think it's unfair for legislators and, and their support staffs to come into that city and have to pay a commuter tax. But these are the same legislators that created Act 47 and all the other mechanisms of state government which have failed. You know, we can all stand here and we can all talk about what should or what shouldn't happen and whether we should be able to file bankruptcy or not. But you know, the truth of the matter is that when you uh, look at the whole scenario as it stands, this city will never satisfy the debt it's saddled with. We're borrowing so much money to make it through this year that it's obscene. We've taxed everything I think we can tax. We're blaming to be honest with you, we're blaming the University of Scranton and the area colleges for, uh, you know, not uh, furnishing the city with money and for expanding. But is it really their fault that everybody's abandoned the city and property became so cheap that they could gobble it up? And I, and I also believe that the city used its process of condemnation to help develop some of these situations. I think it's very important for us to really find out how we got here. And I honestly believe that if anybody should solve this city's problems, that the, the, the ball should be put in Harrisburg's court. But then when you take a look at what's occurred in Harrisburg, whether it's the Pennsylvania Turnpike Authority or all the other things they've touched, education, everything, it's a minefield. They've destroyed everything around them. You take a look at the federal government. What happened to revenue sharing and all the other things that used to come to cities at one time? We're fighting proxy wars all over the world, but we have no money for our own people. I really think we have a lot of problems, and I think that, uh, in my own opinion, we've elected spaghetti dinner politicians from the bottom of this country all the way up the chain. It's all about a sound bite and how good it sounds. Deception is the rule. Honesty is not accepted. People in this city don't want the truth because they can't take the truth. And they can't <clears throat> shoulder the burden of taxation that will right this city. Perpetual borrowing in front of ourselves for decades isn't an answer because the population will not be here to sustain the, date, the debt. And you know, the, the major problem I think we are faced with is we wait until politicians are in office for 20 years and they've created such egregious crimes against the people that we finally prosecute them. And then we strip them of their pension, throw them in jail for three to four, five years, but then we're stuck with all the destruction they've created. And we wonder why our society is spinning backwards. That's the problem. People have to come out and vote to protect their own interests. And that own interest is a legitimate government based in respect for the individual and individual property rights. And when the government moves into every sphere it can to tax and deprive people of income and their rights as Americans, it's wrong. But you won't hear people say that because they've become dependent on government. A very large percentage of Americans are waiting for a check to come in the mail and they don't care where it came from. And it's time to start asking Americans if we're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar we spend and you want a smaller government, what do you want to give up? And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Gervasi. Good evening, City Council. My name is Dave Gervasi. I'm a firefighter with the City of Scranton. I'm here on a lighter note tonight. Um, I was asked to come to explain our smoke detector installation program our fire department is now running again. Uh, we just received many more smoke detectors and we want to explain a little bit of our program. 
Um, it is for city residents uh, only. We obviously cannot send out our crews to install smoke detectors outside of the city. Um, it is not for landlords. Uh, we must do the installations. That's one prerequisite of the grant, some of the rules that are in the grant that we received. And uh, when the program, when our smoke detectors run out, the program is over until hopefully we can get more grants to get more smoke detectors. And how this work is very simple. I'm going to give everyone some information, some contact information of how you can have smoke detectors free of charge in installed by Scranton firefighters in your home. And if everybody that's watching can grab a pencil and paper, we'll give that information. How this works is you will call our Fire Prevention Bureau. Uh, our Fire Prevention Officer's name is Sean Flynn. His phone number is 348-4164, 348-4164, extension 1. He can also be contacted by email. It's S, as in Sam, Flynn, F-L-Y-N-N, -N, at scrantonpa.gov. Or there's additional information on our City of Scranton website, www.scrantonpa.gov. What this program is, is this. We in the Fire Prevention Bureau and our Deputy Chief have applied for grants, I believe AFG grants, and we received numerous smoke detectors through a grant program. Also, who helps out probably the most in this whole situation is WNEP Channel, Channel 16. Uh, Lori LaMasters runs this program for Channel 16, and it's through their Operation Save a Life program. And they provide numerous fire departments throughout their entire viewing area, numerous counties, dozens of counties. And we'd like to thank Lori LaMasters for all the work she does. And how this works is this. You will call up the contact information, call us or email us, and we will call you back. We will set up a time. It doesn't have to be during the day. Our firefighters are on 24-7. If, you, if you, you, know, you don't get home out of work till after 6 o'clock, we can set up an installation at uh, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night. Um, one requisite I, that I mentioned earlier is that we cannot give out the smoke alarms. You can't just come down to the city hall or the fire department and we give them to you because then we don't know if you're actually going to install them. So we, you, we must, they must be installed by fire department personnel. We will send an engine company or a truck company out to your home and we will install them. We will put them in, in strategic areas of your house so you have the optimum protection from the smoke alarms. And um, non-residents, we just want to mention non-residents, if you're not a resident of the city of Scranton, Lawyer LaMasters, WNEP, Again, it covers numerous counties. So anyone who lives outside the city who is listening to this, we can't install your smoke alarms, but we, we urge you to call your volunteer paid fire departments wherever you live, and most likely they are a part of that program. They may have uh, smoke alarms that they will install free of charge for you too. So that's about it, and Mrs. Evans, with your permission, I'd like to turn over the contact information to your uh, public safety liaison, Jack Lascom. Yes, and he can please. repeat this maybe during motions in case someone didn't have an opportunity to write down the contact information. They can say it again during motions. Is that okay? And again next week at our meeting. Sure. Okay. Very we'll good. We'll continue to repeat that. Thank you very much for your time. And we urge everyone to please take advantage of this program. It could save your life. And we like, again, thank, thank WNEP Channel 16, Lori LaMasters, and our Fire Prevention Bureau for, for getting these grants and, and getting numerous smoke alarms. Thank you very much for your time. If I can just say a few Thank words, you. I do commend Mr. Gervasi for bringing it to the public attention like this. Um, and if you've noticed, Channel 16 early in the mornings, they do have public service announcements. It's been ongoing for several years. Um, I have had the opportunity to refer several people to the fire department. And uh, within a timely manner, the smoke uh, detectors were installed. And as Mr. Gervasi stated, they have to be installed by the firefighters. Uh, again, for several issues, uh, the issue is that they're not just placed on a shelf somewhere and let go. Um, the other issue that, you know, the firefighters do know the proper locations to place these fire, uh, smoke detectors. I've had people say, can I get a, a smoke detector or two? When the firefighters get out there, they determine that they needed five detectors in the home and they placed them in there. So I think it's a great program and, uh, it should save a lot of lives and anyone especially you know someone that has elderly relatives that uh, that aren't capable or do not have these in their homes please uh, again I'll announce it and uh, we'll try and get the numbers and all that on if they're not already on the website I think Mr. Gervasi said they were but uh, we'll make sure that
public information gets out there. And uh, Dave, if you could get Chris's address behind you there, he had asked me for some too for his uh, mother's house. So, thank you. Okay. As Mr. Gervasi said, no tips will be accepted for the installation of these. <laughs> they may take a cookie or two, though. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gerard Hetman. Good evening, Council. Good, Good, evening. Good, evening. Good evening. Gerard, Gerard Hetman from Lackawanna County's Department of Community Relations. To begin this evening, I do have some handouts that I would like to distribute to Council. May I please approach? Yes. Yes. Thank you. The first item in the packet that you have in front of you this evening is an application and also an instruction and guidance manual for the new Lackawanna County SBA fee loan waiver, SBA loan fee waiver program. Uh, this is a program that I've talked about on previous visits to council. It will take effect in, it will come into effect January 1st of 2013. And this is a key component in the Lackawanna County Commissioner's job creation and economic development initiatives that are being brought into bear with the 2013 budget cycle. How the program works is the SBA fee waiver program allows qualified businesses to have the fees paid by Lackawanna County's Economic Development Department that are normally associated with receiving an SBA loan. And this is a common component in seeing businesses create jobs and expand their workforces, uh, businesses that typically set up shop in Scranton, Lackawanna County. This is often a feature of their economic development plans, their business plans, business models. And again, this process, this program, allows the fees associated with those loans qualified businesses go through the process outlined in the manual. Uh, there is an application included in there, and once they go through the application and vetting process, the county will provide funding to pay the extra fees that are associated with the businesses that qualify for those loans. And again, there is an application process and a vetting process to ensure that the loans will be spent, a uh, number of conditions, one of which is that the business has to spend 100% of the loan proceeds in Lackawanna County and also they must be approved for an SBA loan and also approved for a loan by a local lender. And we want to share this with you because we know that as elected officials, you frequently come into contact and are frequently contacted by individuals and by businesses that may look to secure an SBA loan. So we want to provide you with this information to make sure that you are aware of it and that possibly you could refer prospective loan applicants to our program uh, for future information. And for members of the public who may wish to learn more about it, you do have the contact number there, but uh, the program coordinator is Mary Liz Donato with the Lackawanna County Department of Economic Development. Her phone number is 570-963-6830. Um, and the only other item, there's the release with that too, the information release, which I also have. And there's also a schedule uh, from the Lackawanna County Tax Claim Bureau from Mr. Ron Kolejewski uh, for the county's next judicial sale, which takes place in late February. Some of the key dates that are associated with that are included in that same packet. So uh, that's all we have for you this evening. And again, thank you for letting us share that information. We know there's many entrepreneurs and uh, prospective and current business owners and operators who may use SBA funding to grow their businesses throughout the city of Scranton and Lackawanna County. And feel free to share the information with them. And we appreciate your time, as always. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlie Newcomb. Good, Good evening, evening and As congratulations. You know, I was a regular speaker to come here, but I couldn't make it on Monday because our third grandchild was born a little over a week and a half ago, and we've been watching the kids, so I got tied up there. So my first night to get out was tonight. And we want to congratulate you on the birth of your granddaughter. I Thank believe you. it's Allison. Elizabeth? Allison Elizabeth. Yeah, she's doing very well. Wonderful. Very, very good. So now we have three of them. Very, be very beautiful pictures too. Oh, you like them? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. What I wanted to talk about, Mr. Joyce took a lot of the raises I was going to talk about. Um, I'm glad to see that they were amended. But, and I, I'm not blaming anybody up there because you weren't, you know, you weren't even on council when, when we developed a lot of these problems. But 
we're like the federal government. We don't have an income problem. We have a tax and spend problem. I mean, our budget's what, $109 million? It's going to be over $100 million regardless with the raises out. I can remember coming to council meetings here not too long ago when people were coming to the podium saying, we have a $56 million budget, 57, 50, you know what I mean, 58. Now we're at 100 and some, and we have to borrow 21 million and then another 20 some million dollars next year. Some tough decisions definitely have to be made. What I think has to be done is um, we have a severe, as you know, a pension crisis is going to come down next year with the state, you know, the state employees, and, and we have, we have the, the city employees. I mean, they had to go to court, do what they had to do, and I agree. They really got, you know, for 10 years, they haven't got any raises. The mayor really stuck it to them. But then at the end, we got nailed with a $30 million award, which really sent the city into a spiral that I hope we get out of it, but I think it's going to send us far back. And I know they did agree to knock half of it off, which was a, was a great thing. But I do believe that with you on the commuter tax, we had the commuter tax before. We should have never got rid of it. And the only reason why we got rid of it again, political problems. Mayor Connors got rid of it because he was running for Congress. That's one of the main reasons that it, that it, that it disappeared, and now we have to fight to get it back. Some heavy decisions have to be made, and I'll tell you what has to be done for the next mayor coming in. I don't know who it's going to be, he or she, but you people took some people out of the positions of your budgets over the past, like the DPW people and parks and recreation, and I drive around the city, and I still see a lot of them people are still here working, so they're back on the payroll. Seems like nothing gets done, and what's happening in the city is you have the same problem like the federal government. 50% of the people are taking care of this 50, and what I mean by that is we have like 70,000 people maybe in the city. 70,000, 68,000, when you take away how many of those are children, how many of those are retired people that don't work, you probably have 35 to 38,000, maybe 40,000 people that are in the, you know, in the tax rate. And now what they want to do in the federal government where you want to make the people, you know, on the top pay a little bit more, well, what's happening in the city, you're putting a burden on, quote, unquote, the successful people or the business people or whatever. I got a notice in the mail Monday from my mortgage company. Now, we have two properties here in Scranton. One does not have a mortgage. The other one does. Just for next year, for January 1st, they told me my mortgage is going to go up $39. I'm sorry, $39.42. Yeah, $39 That's without, you know, next year's raises or nothing. And I talked to some people today when I was out and about. One guy got one. His is going up 61 another one. So it is the burden falls on the property owners and the business owners are paying these, and they're trying to support, you know, the rest of the city. So what I'd say is when somebody comes in, if our mayor makes $50,000 a year, which he does, I know the mayor in Wilkesboro makes like 70, and he gets to pick the administration, there should not be one person in this city, and I'm talking administration because I know there's labor contracts. I don't know anybody out there that I'm talking to or anybody that makes more money than their boss. That's ridiculous. If the mayor makes 50000 everybody under him or her should never make more than him. And if you don't want to do that job, we don't need solicitors making 83,000. We don't need uh, all these other people making 76, 84, and the mayor making 50. I would never have a business where my employees would make more than me. That makes no sense whatsoever. So I would definitely do that. And as far as the pension end of it goes, I was going to have a question tonight was, um, I'm sure you're aware of the pension situation that we have where, like if we gave that chief a raise, the retired chiefs that are out there would get 50 percent. Mm -hmm. Am I correct, Mr. Joyce? That's correct. So what I'm saying is if, if, if you, we had this in the past, and I brought it up here where Mrs. Gatelli was, and I was right. What I mean by that, so the people out there know, if we, I'm just going to use even numbers. So if we gave the chief right now a $10,000 raise, and there was four fire chiefs out there that fell underneath those contracts from the past, they would each get five. That's another 20000 so that ten thousand, but but that goes on for the rest of your life. So that that costs thirty thousand dollars, and it goes into their pension, and then they make you know x amount of money a month. So those are the kind of things that maybe some people should get changed into a four hundred one k. Like we should never, I never heard of a situation in my life where you profit from retirement. You should never. The retirees, the state people, don't even get when they retire, like the state police, that has to go through an ordinance. They just don't get cost of living automatically, but for the retired people to get 50%, I know none of you people had anything to do with it. It goes from a mayor even before Jimmy Connors, but some, those are the kind of things that we should be going to court to fight, you know, to get rid of, because they're costing us 
much, much millions of dollars down the road that nobody should profit, and the health care, we give it to them and their spouses and their family. Like, we have people right now, I'll say this and then I'll go, we have, what, 398, 397 employees. We have 600 and some retirees, but we're also paying health care for over 2,000 people. My opinion is, is when you retire, and you're retired with a good salary, when you leave, your health care should stay. It should never go with you to your 65 and to your 66, especially if you retire when you're 47 or 48. And I'm not blaming the employee for that because that was something that was negotiated. But when you're in the private sector, that's a different story with you and your employer. But when you're in the public sector, you expect people out there that are making $24,000, $28,000 a year to support you when, you know, your health care and stuff when they can't afford their own. And there's a few city employees, and as you know, Mr. Joyce, if they retired six years ago, I'm sorry, seven, with 50% of a salary, because that's what they get. I believe the police get 50 and the firemen get a little bit more, 55, 57. No. Well, if you investigate, if a guy made 50% when they retired, uh, a police officer, if he made 50, if he was making 40, he retired with 20. If you look over the course of the years with all those special increases and the court awards and everything, you would be surprised to find out that there's a few of those people that are like $1,000 away from what they made when they were working. So you almost retired with your full salary when, because of all, of all the court awards and the increases and everything else. I mean, if you look into it, you would be surprised to find out how much some of those increases these people got over the course of the years. And it's not their fault. It's just the way things were negotiated. So I just think we have to look at those things because we can't afford them. Thank you. Mr. Newcomb. Just a quick question. You, you said how many people are receiving health benefits at this point? The figure that was in the newspaper, I believe, was 2,200. The newspaper stated that? Because I don't believe over, It said over 2,000. It was 600 employees, 398 active employees, and the health care we were paying, it said, I think the figure was 2,256 or 2,156 for employees that we're paying for right now. And the, I mean, I could be wrong, but that was the figure that they had in the paper. That's where I read it. You don't remember when that was in the paper, do you? Okay, thank you. Dave Dobson. Good evening, Dave Dobson, Good resident evening. of Scranton. Good, uh, evening. Good evening. I also uh, mentioned the tow the other night, and I. Uh, now, um, if the city ever got involved with towing, uh, it should be to a repair facility especially if there's a warranty. And that's manufacturers or private. Some places are authorized to do uh, uh, aftermarket warranties uh, that you can buy for your car. I'm sure you've seen them on television. Uh, and if payment is made available to the tow operator, the requested address for off street uh, should even be to the person's home or a repair facility. And uh, I don't have any faith in one person doing it. You're just granting a monopoly there. And uh, tow operators have money on the line for equipment like Mr. Bullis pointed out. And they have location, land, employees, and they all have to be paid for. And uh, that's quite a bit of uh, responsibility. Now, with derelict ve vehicles, we had uh, uh, various blight inspectors going around uh, years back when Mrs. Gatelli and Mrs. Finucci were on the uh, council. And I walk my pooch in the uh, courts a lot, so he's not whizzing against somebody's front doorstep. But uh, uh, I would see some of these a year later sitting in the same yard with this sticker attached that they were supposed to be disposed of or, or uh, something done with them. And uh, the uh, tow operators started paying like uh, money to actually take your uh, derelict car to a salvage yard. I made about $400. I uh, usually retire a car when it's on its last legs, and uh, 
uh, within three or four days, I have a tow operator pick it up. I was paid $400 for three different cars. So they're not sitting in my backyard. They're not an eyesore. They're gone. And I have a couple of dollars in my pocket. And uh, as far as getting an unfriendly type towing situation started, do we really want supporters, your supporters, and friends and family uh, to be towed over uh, forgotten headlamps or something like that? You know, a car won't start, it could just be a dirty battery post or a forgotten headlamp and somebody discharged the car. And finally, the location that's proposed, in my opinion, is horrible. Uh, you have Steamtown there with wrecked, burnt, rusted vehicles. It's totally inappropriate. It's adjacent to the National Park. Lackawanna Avenue and the mall and so forth and uh, I guess you're in charge of this area Jack of uh, the, the legis so I'd like to just ask you something uh, after the meeting okay sure I'm always around I'm like bad news I never go away <laughs> no problem. now uh, there was an article in the paper on pilots and it doesn't look good Already we have our contingency funds spent for people that don't want to turn over even a few dollars in lieu of taxes and it's a shame. It's it's really shame on them. They're they're making thousands and thousands and millions of dollars uh and basically tearing down uh uh already property that they, uh, I heard a couple of years ago now I don't know it didn't happen but they were going to tear down the John Long Center which is a viable building and uh, at the U and put something else up well if they build up just great but uh, and it's not only the university uh, uh, it's it's all over these people really need to come up with it and our mayor and Pell need to uh, start to enforce this. It's, it's just uh, unconscionable that they, pr uh, they, uh, they suggest this and then you turn around and uh, it gets, uh, it gets uh, thrown out with the wash. You know, it's, it's just a shame. We really need this pilot money. I can't keep paying taxes and either that or we have to start zoning and and uh, just make it impossible for another uh, any more expansion. And uh, I'll make it quick. The Golden Parrot, the submarine type equipment was given to a city, uh, local governments without deep rivers or lakes. <laughs> bok bok. And uh, Rick Scott, governor of Florida, before he was elected governor, he uh, collected unemployment compensation while on a European vacation. And uh, in order to collect it in Florida, you're supposed to uh, apply for five jobs a week and so forth. <laughs> uh, bok bok again. And uh, free lunch for billionaires, countless pension funds bankrupted by Wall Street, including our police and firemen's fund. Well, guess what? That's where some of your property tax increases are going to have to come from. Thank you and have a good night. And don't forget, again, bok, bok, bok. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Andy Spregler, citizen of Scranton, fellow Scrantonians. Good evening. Good evening. I believe what my mother used to tell me, watch your pennies and your dollars will fall. Your notes here, tax assessors report. Have you noticed that people have gotten tax reductions again? There's one person in there with 40,000 tax reduction. I wish you asked Billy, when they send him a notice, some of the backup. Why do these people get this? I mean, when you start giving away $40,000 of tax reduction to anybody, that's a ball. I mean, the school board is taking a hit, as well as the city, but the taxpayers 
in general, take the same hit. For every dollar in reduction somebody gets on their taxes, somebody has to make it up. And you got another one here. Minutes of the Scranton Lackawanna uh, Health and Welfare. Have you ever read the minutes on that? You should. Mm -hmm. This is where people like Lackawanna College gets the money to buy up properties. Okay? This organization here arranges loans. Mm -hmm. When they get the loans, they go out and buy properties. And then the properties become tax exempt. And who has to take the burden? The people. Like I say, you, you put everything on the commuters because they're easier to grab. They're already paying taxes somewhere along the line, at least the 52. So you can use that to really put the, the buying on them. But there's a lot of other people that should be paying the 52 that probably isn't paying the 52. Have you ever asked Billy how many judges are paying the 52 bucks? Or how many people that works in the state office building are paying the 52 bucks? Or any of the federal or state or local offices are paying the 52 bucks that, re that them buildings reside in Scranton? Probably they don't. You must ask Billy to do what he can do. We're in a bad position, there's no question about it. I don't think your 12% is gonna fly. It's an election year, so why not go with it? But when you're telling me you're not paying landfill because we don't have the money to pay the landfill and we are gonna hold them, that's a bad sign. Scranton prides itself on paying their own way. We always did. It's a shame that we're not doing it anymore. I know the federal government believes in borrowing a lot to pay off their debt, but Scranton never did. We always tried to live within our means, which was a good policy. Your mother had that policy. Mm -hmm. I learned from my mother that policy, live within your means. And you gotta do that. You, I mean, you're gonna have to borrow. There's no question the money isn't there. I wish the state would allow us to print our own or the federal. Then we'd be in the, out of this bind. But unfortunately, they don't. Where the money is going to come from, I don't know. Because from your own figures, it's going to be tough for them to work. And it's a shame that they can't work. But 12% probably is unrealistic. Probably should be what the mayor actually said. I don't usually agree with the mayor. But I, probably we should add the first at 29%. And the reasons why to try to avoid some of the borrowing. When you borrow, you almost have to double the cost. You borrow 10 million, you end up paying 20 million. But the trouble is, a lot of us are fairly old. And we ain't gonna have to pay that 20 million. We're gonna be long dead. But our grandchildren or our children may have to. I don't believe in that. I believe and not passing the debt to our children or grandchildren. I believe if we create the debt, we should take it on as a burden that we have to pay, as a dedication. Life is short for all of us. We only go around once. But why ruin it on somebody else? This is going to affect our city long after we're gone. We're going to still be paying for all this debt. Most of us will probably be dead that's up in the 60s or 70s before this debt is ever paid off. But the question is, will people want to survive it within the city? I mean, we can't just keep borrowing, borrowing, borrowing in hopes that some way we're going to win the lottery. I wish we would. Would help a lot, especially if we hit that big one. But we're not. So, like I said before, just them two things would be a help in the future. I'm not going to get into the debt. You all know what the heck it is. I don't have to get into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chrissy. That's some double doing. Chrissy. Nice hat, buddy. Thank you. Well, Janet, they did it for your night, so they got a game tomorrow night. If they win this one. I hope they win this one tomorrow. I hope they win it tomorrow. You know that, yes. right, Frank? 
Oh, yeah. There you go. That's right. Oh, at the end, it's just Sunday. Down our bank. That guy's going down our bank just Sunday. Hello, the bank. Where I live, Jack? Yep. Pretty good to an over. Stop, stop over. That was our domain. Yeah, it's our domain. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay, Chrissy. Good evening, Council. Marie Schumacher, city resident and taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'd like to start with the storage proposal because it gets to the core of the function of government. Uh, I believe the role of government is to do those things that are essential to the well-being of the citizens but require too large an investment to be accomplished privately and usually involves defense fire and police at the local level and national defense at the federal level. It is not to allow a private company to make an investment to start a business, pay uh, mercantile and business privilege taxes off the top of their revenue, and then rip that business away from the private investor. This piece of proposed legislation is a perfect example of government's in-your-face arrogance that tells people who hire them and pay their expenses they are inconsequential. The needs of government trump the needs of the individual, and they slash you are able to get their way because they have the power to harm you. Now, two quick questions on the parking meter proposal. Uh, what is the period of the lease being proposed, and are there any options to extend the base period? And second, was this opportunity advised uh, for bids? And maybe you could answer that in fifth order, because I'd like to get through what I have here tonight. Thank you. Um, I would like to recommend that you add funding for herbicide to be applied to every lot which remains after a demolition to keep the land from becoming overgrown and a place to harbor vermin. Um, I was really upset when I saw the public safety false alarm penalties you were proposing uh, for next year. $500 or a 67% increase from 2012 rate for second and third uh, and $1,000 for each over the third or a 230% increase. And this is on top of a doubling from $150 to $300 in 2012 for all but the first. Um, that is just over the top. Revenue from that source through September per year budget was $50, so perhaps it's not that big a deal, but I still believe the increases are way over the top. According to my analysis, as I said on, uh, on Monday night, the year-to-date revenues, uh, as well as prior year's revenues, the uh, 2013 revenues are overstated. I would, uh, my estimation says by five to seven million dollars. 2012 expenses have been forecast to exceed revenue by $4 million. Mr. McGowan testified at the second unfunded debt hearing that the city would need more than $13 million by the end of the year, but requested approval for $9.75 million because he believed that was the most the city could access in the financial market. Well, if the council and administration believe they couldn't access an additional $4 million in October, what will the chances be for next year after two more bonds, one for $20.9 million and the other for $25 million? An overstatement of revenues would allow presentation of a balanced budget. But what happens if these revenues don't come to fruition? I guess we'll find that out next year. There are three large debt service payments forecast to be expended in 2013 per year budget. 1.7 million for the 2011 unfunded debt, 1.7 for the 2012 Series C bond, and 1.7 for the uh, 25 million to be borrowed next year. Now the interesting part of these payments, which are pretty much identical, some have $1,000 here or there, but are the differing principal amounts, $9.85 million for the first, $20.9 million for the second, and $25 million for the third. This just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Even more questionable is why the Judge Peter J. O'Brien's decree that the second unfunded debt be repaid through an increase in the millage 
dedication of real estate taxes over a 10 year period. However, the borrowing for this debt is part of the 20.9 million or the 2012 Series C bond. But the 2013 real estate tax was not raised to provide its portion of payment of this expense. If I understood Mr. Joyce's Section 28 addition to that borrowing ordinance uh, for 2012, the bond revenue will be used to pay the 2013 payment. Does this not mean that the judge's decree is being circumvented at the least or ignored at the worst? Mr. Joyce? Um, actually, Ms. Schumacher, I was advised by our council solicitor that um, we cannot respond to your questions or comment because you are an adversarial party um, in litigation against the city of Scranton next week. Okay, thank you. I don't usually get much of an answer anyway, but thank you. Is there anyone else? Faye Ferranis Granton. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Um, sometimes I have to wonder where half these people that come here live, like Marie and uh, Lee Morgan. They seem to go against everything you do to help the city and stick up for the people outside the city. I don't get it. First of all, I believe in the commuter tax. When these people come to the city, they get the services that I pay for in my taxes. They don't pay for them. I pay my property tax. I pay my, if I pay, you know, all the taxes that we have. That covers your garbage and everything like that. They don't pay that, but they're getting it. And they say they're gonna not support the business. I don't believe that. I just think you should stick to your guns. We need every penny we could get for the people in the city, and I'm sure most of the people, loads of the people, agree with that, getting the commuter tax, because it's gonna help them. And we need everything we can to help them, and people are struggling. So these people work in Scranton, that's their choice, so let's give a little bit here and there, and, and I hope those judges really understand the struggle we're in and the financial mess that we're in. Look at, look at Her Her uh, not, Hazleton, rather. That mayor wants an 83% tax increase, okay? That's something like PEL wanted to do, but what did you do? You and Mr. Joyce and Mr. Loscombe, along with the business manager and stuff, you fought and fought and fought and struggled and, and went through meetings after meetings and months after months, but you got it down to 12%. Some people were cynical and say you're not gonna get 12%, you have to go way up. We'll see, but you're trying. Nobody gives you any credit for trying. All they do is criticize things that didn't happen yet and don't give you any credit for all the hard work that you did. I don't get it. Like Lee Morgan always said we should file bankruptcy. Doesn't he realize that when you file bankruptcy the state could come in here and we have no say and they could tax the people. 90 percent, 100 percent, 120 percent. They could do whatever they want. We have no control. That's what they want. I'd like to see some of these people do a better job than you have and I'd like to see them take the abuse that you take because I don't think they could stand it. Mr. Rogan, will you be running again or you can't run because of Lou Barletta won? I haven't decided yet. I, legally, I didn't think you could. Um, That's my question. Again, we could talk about this outside of council chambers. I don't, I don't think it's appropriate for the meeting. Well, I do because... <laughs> but I don't want I to talk about politics at the meeting. You're a politician. Well, I consider myself a public servant, but... Okay, that's another issue. Well, Mrs. 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 Frannis, if um, Mr. Rogan has said that he's willing to speak to you outside the meeting, then I, I think that that would be that's appropriate. Fine. Okay. Now, as far as the towing goes, Mr. Rogan, you mentioned last week that government was taking over. You're representing the people, not the tow truck drivers. There's only a handful of them. There's more of there's 70,000 more, 75,000 more of us than there are of them. They're getting much money from towing cars. That's not a little money, a little bit of money. They're getting a lot of money. So sure, they, they're coming here and saying they, they need it. Well, I can understand that, but we need it more. And if we have the opportunity to get the money for the city, that's the direction we should be going because certain things that you were planning on doing maybe won't work out, like the University of Scranton stuff paying more, who knows? But at least you're trying. 
So I hope you don't go on that route again about the government taking over and you want to take care of these tow truck drivers because that's totally nuts. Take care of the people that voted for you and, and fight for them to get as much money into the city as you can. Another thing, this is an issue nothing to do with politics. Pit bulls. I'm so tired of hearing about pit bulls, how dangerous they are, you should pass a law. Please don't you ever pass a law. Because I read meters and was out every day with dogs day and night, pit bulls could be the most gentle dog in the world. It's not the dog, it's the owner. And if you've noticed, a lot of hoods and gangsters get pit bulls. And what do they do to them to make them bite? They abuse them. So what should be happening is the police should be arresting them for animal abuse. These poor dogs don't have a chance, some of them that are abused. And it's not just pit bulls. Any dog that bites has a reason. If I went home and punched my dog in the face, I'm sure he'd bite me. But he doesn't. He kisses me because I love him. And that's what people don't do with some of these dogs. And... And to go against pit bulls is totally nuts. Go back to the owner and find out why they're like that. And then get the owner. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Good evening, Mary Chalipko, resident city of Scranton. Good evening. Um, I do have a positive note. I don't know if anybody mentioned a very positive note for the city that Matt McGloin returned to the area as the winner of the Burlesworth Trophy, awarded to the walk-on player and voted by a committee and fans for excellence. And that's one of the things that we can be very, very proud of. And I'm very glad, I don't know them, but to see us dad in the grocery store now and then, but I'm very proud of the McGloin family and our city. Um, I did come here with a page and a half about the raises, but I guess they've been, it's been amended. There will be no raises? Yes, it's my intention not to have any raises. Okay, sure because I can't see anybody with a conscience taking raise the way the city, the shape the city is in right now. And if they don't like it, they can resign. I'm sure there's another crony waiting in the wings for some of those jobs. Word comes to mind entitlement. My opinion is that Boo Bear will be going to the Scranton Chamber of Commerce sometime next year anyway, that being Mayor Doherty, Boo Bear. Um, there's another, he'll, he'll fit in perfectly with a do-nothing, not accountable, elitist lifetime job. Um, again, I had so much on the raises. As far as the parking lot, um, when people come here, and here I am now with people that come here that have given probably more grief than, than anybody that we can speak of, um, to come here and call people nuts now, there's, there's another issue. Um, I don't have any tow truck operators in my family. I do believe that council is trying very hard, but when you just had all these problems with the parking authority, it seems crazy to get into another parking lot situation. Um, we want the police. I know for a fact how busy the animal control officer is with so many issues in the city of Scranton. We want the police to handle storage now. We want the police to take care of animals. Um, and I, as a neighborhood leader, understand how hard the police department works. I don't think it's the time to get into storage. With, and some of the things that Mr. Bolas mentioned, when I hear people up there talk about we're going to get into auctioning cars off now, it's just not practical right now. As far as the nonprofits, maybe they're smarter than we think. We, we want to go after and after, but the, the nonprofits know how to make money. And I don't, I'm beginning to think, why would, they, why would they give money to, we're so demanding, and where would the money go? Why would you give money to a mismanaged, losing proposition? I think there needs to be another approach taken to the nonprofits. As far as Pinebrook, we've had a good year. And I do want to thank some people responsible for that. Mr. Rogan, Mr. Loscom, Chief Graziano, Lieutenant Marty Crofton, and our neighbors, and also the Department of Economic and Community Development, who really did um, fairly give us a good amount of paving and paved a lot of the streets in Pinebrook. So hopefully next year we'll bring changes for the better. And um, I'm glad the raises are not on the table right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> of course, you. You do a great job with the Pinebrook Neighborhood yes. Group. You know, I know 
I've seen Mr. Loss come at many of the meetings, talk to the residents. If, if you didn't organize the group, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to come. So thank you for what you do as well. Is there anyone else who would like to address council? 5A, motions. Mr. McGough, do you have any motions or comments? Thank you. Uh, first, uh, brief comments on the uh, towing uh, and storage uh, legislation or idea. Um, as far as the towing part of it is concerned, I, I, I think it's a fine idea. Uh, the, the part that bothers me about it is the storage. Uh, I do have some concerns with what could take place and problems that could be associated um, with the storage of automobiles. Uh, I did ask Mr. Bolas about unclaimed cars. He said possibly 20%. I've talked to some, some other towers and they said as many as four, four or five out of every 10 cars goes unclaimed. Uh, I don't know that we need to deal with that situation. I realize that it could, it could create some income for the city or some revenue for the city. But at the same time, as we get into the business of dealing with unclaimed cars and the cost associated with that, perhaps we're not going to realize the revenues that we think we are. Um, again, in talking with people about how you would go about getting rid of these unclaimed cars, it, it, it's not an easy process and it does have some cost concerned with it. And as somebody mentioned, I don't know that we want to get into um, being auctioneers for unused cars either. Uh, it, to me, it just presents some concerns and what I th think could be some problems associated with the storage of the automobiles. The other thing that does concern me is the, the loss of business that would be incurred by the, the towers. Um, at a time when we're raising taxes and fees for small businesses, we're, in this case, we're asking them to pay more for the right to operate a business, and yet we're taking part of their revenue away from them. Um, I, I don't know if that is an equitable thing to do. So again, I, I would like to see you know, more on how this is going to, or I'd like to hear more on how this is going to operate and the effects that it will have. I, I think we need some, some solid answers rather than some speculation on how this is going to take place. Um, the budget amendments that were presented uh, to us this evening, and I know Mr. Rogan has mentioned that he too was going to uh, present some amendments to the budget. Uh, I'm going to ask that uh, when they are presented, if we can read them individually and vote on them individually. There are, there are some of the things that have been proposed, and I'm sure some of the things that Mr. Rogan ha will propose that I may agree with, and there may be some that I disagree with. I would rather deal with them on an individual basis rather than group them together and vote on them as one. Uh, I, I think that does a, an injustice to the process and to the ultimate um, voting on the budget. Uh, I know in the past we have taken a look. We, in the past, we have read them individually. We've done amendments as, you know, grouped together. It will take longer uh, to do them individually, but I, I think that is something that uh, yeah, we should do. Uh, the, the time that's, uh, that would be devoted to that, uh, I, I think, would be uh, worthwhile. And, and lastly, um, tomorrow we commemorate Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, 
uh, December 7th, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. Um, each year when I taught, uh, I took time to commemorate and to commend uh, the people who, the men and women who sacrificed so much in that horrible war. And I think it's uh, tomorrow is a day when we should look back and we're, we're losing that greatest generation very quickly. Um, I think tomorrow would be a great time to reach out to those people and to say thank you for all that they did for this country. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rogan, do you have any motions or comments? Yes, um, since I have some motions, I will wait until uh, Mrs. Evans and Mr. Loscom return. Okay. <laughs> uh, that may, we'll take a break. <laughs> I guess I'll speak a little bit and uh, I'll say my piece since Mr. Loscom is out. And then I guess we could revert back to you Thank and you. that would be fine. Well, first tonight I want to address some of the amendments that I wish to make next week. Um, the reduction in expenditures that I'll make are to remove all the raises that were proposed in the 2013 operating budget that was sent uh, from the administration on November 8th, or 15th that I had input into. And um, like Mr. McGough said, I, I think it would be a good idea to vote on one or each amendment individually as there may be some things that we all agree with and some things that we don't agree with. So the first amendment that I'll make is to reduce the standard salary of the uh, fire department by 16 which will eliminate the raise of the chief. The second amendment that I'll make will be to reduce the standard salary of city council by $15,000, which will eliminate the raise of the council solicitor. The third amendment that I'll make is to reduce the standard salary of the business administrator office account by $20,000. This will eliminate the raise of the business administrator and the finance manager. The fourth amendment that I'll make is to reduce the standard salary of the HR account by $10,000. This will eliminate the raise of the HR director. The fifth amendment that I'll make is to reduce the standard salary of the law department by $15,000. This will eliminate the raise of the city solicitor. In addition to this, I'll also propose an amendment to reduce the professional services account of the city controller's office by $2,500. As I said before, the reasoning for this is that the Scranton School District will be paying $17,500 for the single tax office audit, and I believe that we should be budgeting and contributing the same. Along with this, I'll also propose an amendment <clears throat> to reduce the professional services account of the law department by $15,000, bringing the professional services amount in the law department to the same level that it was funded for this year, these cuts were necessary since these two departments, these were two departments that really did not make um, any cuts in their operating expenditures. Regarding the raises, tough decisions had to be made. Many of the people in the budget that had raises certainly deserved them. For their hard work and dedication to the city that they provided in the past year, for instance, Boyd Hughes, who worked tirelessly to save the city money and the amount of funds that needed to be transferred to the SPA and identifying that funds could be withdrawn from the debt service reserve fund account rather than the city's general fund. Another example is Ryan McGowan and Mary Lou Murray from the BA's office who worked tirelessly to ensure that unfunded debt borrowing was secured and that the st city stayed fiscally afloat in 2012. Equally involved in the financing transactions were City Solicitor Paul Kelly and Council Solicitor Boyd Hughes. Another example of someone going above and beyond their duties is HR Director Gina McAndrew, who often takes work home, though she earns only the same amount as some of the people that work under her in her office. 
I know the timing of the raises may not have been the best, but I want people to realize that the majority of people who receive raises go above and beyond their duties and were integral um, pieces in keeping the city fiscally afloat in 2012. I certainly hope that we do not lose some of these people as we move into 2013. Last week I delivered a PowerPoint presentation of the 2013 operating budget that was formed primarily by the administration with input from some Scranton City Council members. To begin tonight, in case um, uh, you may not be, have been uh, tuning in last week or you may have not been here, I just want to uh, offer a brief recap of the budget and the presentation. First, as dictated by the revised recovery plan, the real estate tax will remain at 12%. This is a court-ordered tax increase associated with the unfunded debt and cannot be reduced. This tax increase is projected to generate an additional $1.7 million in revenue for the city. Though I wish there were no tax increase at all, all steps were taken to keep the tax increase to an amount as low as possible. The tax increase in Scranton's operating budget this year is much lower than some of our surrounding communities, such as Wilkes-Barre, which is proposing a 30% tax increase, and Hazleton, which is proposing an 86% tax increase. Secondly, the refuse fee will remain at $178. It was viewed by some council members during the drafting of the revised recovery plan that it would be very burdensome to increase the refuse fee and taxes in the same year. Third, the real estate transfer tax will be increased from 2.8 to 2.9 percent, which is a 3.5 percent increase. This increase is projected to generate an additional $185,000 per year on an annual basis. Fourth, the wage tax or earned income tax will remain at the same level that it is now, which is 2.4 percent. It is a common misconception that the city receives three point, the 3.4 percent wage tax as taken out of paychecks of Scranton residents. However, 1 percent goes to the school district of the 3.4 percent tax, and the uh, remaining 2.4 percent is received by the city. <coughs> Fifth, the mercantile tax will be increased from 0.875 mills to 1 mill in 2013, which is a 14.3 percent increase. This tax is being returned to its 2010 level of 1 mill before it was reduced in 2011. The tax increase is projected to generate an additional $200,000 in revenue for the city. Sixth, the business privilege tax will be increased from 0.875 mills to 1 mill in 2013, which, like the, uh, the mercantile tax, is a 14.3% increase. Also, like the mercantile tax, the business privilege tax is being returned to its 2010 level of 1 mill before it was reduced in 2011. The tax increase is projected to generate an additional $313,625 for the city. Seventh, the local services tax, or LST, which is the $2 tax that is taken out of most people's paychecks on a biweekly basis, is staying the same as required by law. The local, or the local Tax Enabling Act, as amended, sets the limit on this tax to $52 per year. Therefore, with this in mind, it's staying the same. Eighth, the parking tax rate, which is 10% on parking garages and private lots where a fee to park is charged, will remain the same in 2013. Because collections of this tax were slow in, tw in 2012, it is projected that this tax will generate $225,000 in revenue in 2013 as opposed to $500,000 that it was projected to generate in 2012. Ninth, there will be a commuter tax levied pending court approval. The commuter tax will be a 1% tax on the wages of individuals working in Scranton that do not reside in the city. It has been projected by Pell, the Pennsylvania Economy League, that this tax will generate $2.5 million for the city of Scranton in its first year. 
10th, there will be an amusement tax in 2013. In 2013, there will be a 5% tax levied on amusements. Amusements that are impacted by this tax would be primarily tickets to concerts and amusement venues throughout the city of Scranton. This tax is also limited to for-profit organizations and is projected to generate $200,000 in revenue for, for the city. Eleventh, revenue from licenses and permits is projected to be higher in 2013 than in 2012. The reason for this is the Geisinger expansion project that is projected to take place in the upcoming year. Due to the project, it is projected that there will be an increase in licenses and permits revenue of $764,000. Twelfth, fine forfeits and violations revenue is projected to be higher in 2013 than 2012. This is due to the city entering into a contract with Standard Parking to have them provide meter collections and fine issuance for the city. Extra revenue will be generated due to technological advancements being made to parking meters in 2013 by IPS, which was the company chosen to make the upgrades. Scranton will also be looking into establishing a city-owned storage yard, which has been the subject of a lot of uh, dialogue tonight, which fees will be collected for abandoned or towed vehicles. If this does not happen, a suitable replacement for the revenue projected to be made will need to be found. Because of the measures that I just mentioned, there is projected to be an overall increase of $586,000 in fines, forfeits, and violations. Thirteenth, in regard to departmental earnings, in 2013, there is projected to be an increase in departmental earnings of $487,500. This can be attributed to an increase in revenue partially because of the installation of smart meters by IPS and partially because of an increase in the charge for false alarms. In 2013, there will be no charge for a first false alarm, a $500 charge for a second and third false alarm, and a $1,000 charge for a fourth false alarm and any false alarm thereafter. Fourteenth, there will be an increase in miscellaneous revenue generated in 2013. This could be attributed to the city projecting to sue for the repayment from the icebox development and a market-based revenue opportunity program which will be enhanced in 2013. The projection of revenue that the city is expected to receive from the repayment from the icebox development is $600,000 and the market uh, the revenue that the city is expected to receive from the uh, market-based revenue opportunities program as projected by Pell is three hundred fifty three thousand four hundred twenty one dollars fifteenth there will be borrowing that will take place in 2013 in order to pay back the Supreme Court award and partially pay increased pension contributions that the city will be required to pay in 2013 <clears throat> Speaking of the Supreme Court award, this is the primary reason why the budget amount is so high this year, as it is in excess of $109 million. As one knows, the city will incur extra expenses this year due to the Supreme Court award. The first cost that the city will incur is approximately seven, uh, is $17 million in a payout to the police and fire unions. As I'll mention again, this could have been well in excess of $30 million if it were not for the negotiation efforts of some council members and the administration to mitigate the award. Along with the payout for the Supreme Court award, the city will have to borrow to obtain the money to pay it. This will be an estimated cost of $1.7 million this year. Because the Supreme Court award set minimum staffing levels for police shifts, it is projected that there'll be an extra $400,000 in police overtime this year. In addition to the Supreme Court award, there'll also be an increase to the MMO, which stands for Minimum Municipal Obligation. The MMO is the minimum amount that the city must contribute to fund pensions. In 2012, the MMO was $4.4 million. In 2013, the MMO will be $9.5 million. 
This is an extra expense of $5.1 million. Overall, the increases that I just mentioned add up to $24.2 million, which is the approximate spending gap between the 2012 and 2013 budgets. And that's all I have for now. Um, you thank you, Councilman Joyce. Mrs. Evans, I was out when it came to my turn. Would I be able to make my well, guess? Yes. Yeah, what did you make? Oh, I'm sorry. I, th I was out. I thought I had a me I had motions to make, so I wanted to wait until you guys were back, okay. so everybody I would apologize. have a chance. That's oh, that's okay. Um, as I stated, I will pass out a copy to my colleagues. Um, the motion that I'm about to read is regarding the establishment of a city lot which is budgeted for $300,000 in revenue. So obviously by eliminating that $300,000 in spending cuts needed to be made. So I will read it then if we get time the question I'll explain it in further. I make a motion to amend item 6B as follows. Revenue, count number 01.331.33165. Police towing slash towing fees, $0. Expenses, 4010, standard salary. $22,326,610.10. 4117, health insurance, non-union, $938,665.97. Professional services, account number 4201, $608,731.68. 4240, postage and freight, $25,258.07. 4290, stationary office supplies, $20,825. 4270, dues and subscriptions, $9,161. 4390, materials and supplies, miscellaneous, $169,730.48. 4290, non-department expenditures, $47,202,446.48. For a total cut of three hundred thousand dollars, they will be as follows: Fire Department, Chief Standard Salary, Account Number Four Zero One Zero, One Zero Point One One Zero One One Point Zero 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 Seven Eight Point Four Zero One Zero, Sixty Seven Thousand Two Hundred Twenty Eight Dollars and Eleven Cents. It's a decrease of sixteen thousand two hundred fifty eight dollars and seven cents. City Council. Legislative legal advisor, full time, 4010, 01.020000000.4010, standard salary, $224,404.50. Total, the legislative legal assistant, full time, will be paid at $52,500. Business administration, account number 4010. 01.040000.41410 standard salary $197,765.75 as follows business administrator $53,550.00 it's a $10,000 decrease finance manager $37,400 that's a $10,000 decrease senior accountant zero that is the elimination of one of the three positions that was being put into the budget, saving some $37,400. Business Administration, Human Resources, 4010, 01.040, 0000041, 4010, standard salary, $104,184.50. HR Director, Pell Coordinator, $36,000. It's a savings of $10,000. Law Department, 4010, 01.060, 0000.41, standard salary total, $153,960.43. City Solicitor, full time, $52,500. It's a savings of $15,000. City Council, 4201. 01020.000000.4201 professional services $66,000 it's a savings of $20,000 business administration 4201 
01.040.0040.4210. Professional services, $30,000. Savings of $15,000. 4240, 01.040.00040.4240. Postage and freight, $25,158.07. Savings of $4,841.93. Count number 4270-01.040-00040.4270. Dues and subscriptions, $1,000. Savings of $6,500. Count number 4290-01.040.00040. .4290, stationary office supplies, $15,000, savings of $3,000. Human resources, 4201, 01.040.00041.4201, professional services, $120,000, savings of $30,000. Information technology, account number 4390.01.040.00042, Point four three nine zero material supplies miscellaneous ten thousand dollars it's a deduction of five thousand dollars bureau of treasury four two zero one zero one point zero four zero point zero 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 four three point four two zero one professional services twenty thousand dollars it's a decrease of ten thousand dollars license inspections and permits count number four two zero one zero one point zero five one Point zero 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 five one point four two zero one professional services savings of two thousand three thousand dollars a savings of two thousand dollars lips bureau of buildings four two zero one zero one point zero five one point zero 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 eight two point four two zero one professional services fifty thousand dollars savings of twenty thousand dollars law department count number four two zero one 01.060.000.4201 professional services $150,000 savings of $50,000 non-departmental expenditures 4299 01.401.10060.4299 Everhart Museum $10,000 deduction of $15,000 I'll second the motion. Is there anyone on the question? Yes, yes. I'd just like to explain. Um, oh. I apologize, it's so lengthy with all the account numbers. Um, the reason for the amendment, and I know many people have talked today and over the past few weeks, and the two, two of the main points that many people are very upset about in this budget was A, salary increases for many people in the administration and the city council solicitor. The vast majority of them were removed, as I stated previously. In this amendment, um, Attorney Hughes's salary was increased to that of Attorney Kelly in a full-time position, because I, I thought that was, from comments made by colleagues, was the intent. If we want to drop that down as well, I have no problem with that in a future amendment. Um, but getting to the core issue with the towing, I firmly believe that the city, in any city, should not be in the business of towing vehicles, if that were to happen, storing vehicles, operating a city-owned lot. There are so many things that I think have not been planned with this ordinance, outside the fact that I don't believe it's part of the scope of government to be involved with towing and storage. For starters, there's 15 family businesses that currently do towing and storage for the city. They pay the city for the right to work. They also pay property taxes to the city, which are going up. They also pay mercantile taxes to the city, which are going up. They also pay business privilege taxes to the city, which are going up. Their employees pay the second highest wage tax in the state to the city. Luckily, that isn't going up. As you can see, these businesses are already contributing a very large sum to the city. And to go after them in a budget to save in the grand scheme of things, a fraction of the budget. Also, a city lot would have to be staffed 
security cameras would have to be set up, and I believe they, they may already be. The intent of this legislation, from what I have heard, is to have the police department run it. We have a great police department in this city, but their job is to be on the street fighting crime. It's not to be administering a parking lot. If this is approved, the city would likely have to provide additional insurance to cover the vehicles that are in the city lot. There are questions on what will happen to the cars that are kept in the city lot that aren't picked up. The city doesn't have a salver's license, as I mentioned. Somebody mentioned that they could be auctioned off, but many times banks own these vehicles. And people are basically underwater on their vehicle, it breaks down, and they leave and then the city's stuck with it for less than it's worth. Where will the city find the money to buy equipment necessary to run the lot? If you have hundreds of cars that don't run and you have to and you have them in a lot and you have to access the car in the back of the lot, you have to find a way to access that car. So is the city going to purchase a tow truck to move those vehicles? That seems very expensive. There are also safety issues. If the police officers would be the ones running the lot, if somebody's car was towed and they went to pick up their personal possessions, that police officer would have to go in the car. There may be needles, blood, if the car was in an accident, needles if the person was involved with drug activity. Um, if it was an abandoned car, there could be animals in the vehicle. And these are all stories that I've heard from our local towing companies over the last week. Um, there's also a fear by many residents of, our, of a city lot being come, becoming like those in Philadelphia. Many have seen the show on A&E, Parking Wars where people's cars towed off to a, a city-owned lot as an attempt to raise revenue. And oftentimes people miss flights, people have their whole day ruined by it just so the city can make $35 off them. And finally, it's just the core belief of mine that this is expansion of government well beyond its means. Government should not be in the towing business. I've stated it before, if government only, if, if the city of Scranton only provides Public safety, we've done our job. Towing and city lots isn't something the government should be involved in. So that is why I made the motion. Is there anyone else on the question? Yes. Um, um, maybe though before, if I just could. Sure. Um, I'm going to ask that our finance chair will review all of these amendments. I've only, because I've just received them, I've only been able to take a very cursory look. I think there are some uh, items that certainly bear deliberation and discussion and votes, and there are other items, I believe, that don't fall into that category, but again, that's a cursory view. And so I'm going to ask that our finance chair and everyone else on council over the next several days would take a look at the amendments as well as Mr. Joyce's amendments for their feasibility. And then those that are financially sound will be presented next week for a vote. So. Um, well, there, there is a motion in a second, so. Would you like to table it? No. Well, I know that I won't be voting in favor of it because this has just been, as I said, this was just handed to us, and I think it certainly has to be reviewed, and it certainly uh, as well would have been so much more beneficial if all of this would have been presented at an earlier stage so that some of these suggestions I feel certainly could be included in the budget and others would have been discussed among uh, the administration, council, department heads, etc. So you know that's why we had encouraged everyone to become involved in the process so that <laughs> all of this could have become a part of it. Well it is right now as a, well, as a motion. From the beginning. But um, Mr. Joyce, I'm sorry, I'll call on you now. Well, <coughs> there are many things in this amendment that I agree with, such as the salary decreases. 
and the elimination of raises. However, it's one of my concerns that um, I see that we're taking a little bit of an ax to professional services throughout each of uh, the departments. We've got city council, BA's office, HR, IT, Treasury, uh, LIPS, uh, the Bureau of Buildings, the Law Department, and I'm wondering, have you spoke with the department heads of these departments, or? The, uh, the method that I used was similar to the method that you know, you showed us last time by using what we have spent in the first two thirds of the year to extrapolate a full year expenditure. Now, not on all items, for instance, you know, an item such as utilities would always increase in the third quarter. Um, so I used, you know, some of the items, for instance, that were in here had this year zero dollars spent, but were being budgeted for thousands of dollars next year. And also, there was. And I just found this today, actually, when I was going over everything once again. In the 2012 budget from the city website, it lists professional services for city council at $167,000. The 2013 budget, how it lists the past year and the current year, listed at $187,000. So by making the cuts that were currently in there this year, it's actually not a cut if you go over a two-year period, because back in 2011, we were at $66,000. Um, okay. It, it could have just been a typo. It was something I, I caught at the very last minute. Um, and as far as the other items, you know, I, for instance, and, and I could go through each one of them item by item if you'd like to sit down and go over them. Um, many of them were still at half. If you doubled them, it would still be less than we spent this year on those items. See, well, it's, it, I'm sorry, you go ahead. See, what I know from speaking to the business administrators that were holding back on a lot of bills. And one of the reasons why the amount paid for some of these professional services is so low is due to the fact that we just haven't paid the vendors yet. So it's one of my worries that we actually are spending what was budgeted, however, we just are holding back on paying them because we've been concerned with making payrolls and making payments to our larger vendors like Blue Cross um, and uh, Express Scripts, etc. I would, I, I, I do respect the time that um, was spent in the putting together amendments, and yeah. I and I definitely agree with. Um, the raise reduction or the raise reductions are actually eliminations in, in in this case but if I had to vote on it now as a total package I would vote no because I need to research what impact these reductions in professional services will have because I know that there's some things, in fact, I, I looked um, particularly at departments that didn't cut much from their operating expenditures, such as the law and the fire department. And um, I, I made a few phone calls to speak with um, some city employees, and I found out that, for instance, one of the expenditures in the fire department was for something that was contractual that had to be set at a certain amount due to a labor contract and the other expenditure that was set that went up from the previous year was something that was a matching contribution to a grant that the city would receive if the budget was passed as amended and if not the city would have to forego a $200,000 grant. So right now at this time, I can't vote yes to these amendments as a total package. Um, the only thing yeah. I wanted to add, I'm sorry, and then Go I'll, ahead. Um, <clears throat> the mayor called me today about this particular um, issue of the towers. Uh, he stated that the 300,000 should remain in the budget and that he is uh, in talks with 
the towers, which, are, which will continue throughout December. But if it's placed in the budget, then it would have to be materialized somehow. Am I correct? <laughs> well, certainly because the city yes. needs that $300,000, yeah. yes. So I, I don't see what could be changed after the, you know, after the budget's passed. But well, I guess that's between the mayor and the tower, so. Right. Mr. McGough? I know Mr. McGough had, well, I would, I know Mr. Rogan said that he did not wish to table it, but I'd like to make a motion to table the, uh, the motion. Do we have a motion to table? Do we have a second? I'll second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it and so moved. So the amendments are tabled until next week's meeting, at which time uh, the final amendments will be formally presented during seventh order and voted upon by all council members. Well, maybe this amendment would be a little bit easier for everyone since it only deals with the salaries. I would make a motion to amend item 6B as follows. 4010 standard salary, $22,326,610.10, a deduction of $106,158.07. Fire Department, 4010.10.11. 0.4014, I apologize, standard salary, $7,168,786.27. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but again, I'm going to restate what I, what I just did. We're not going to be voting on any amendments tonight. We're presenting the amendments. Mrs. So Evans, let certainly read through all of them for the public. That's fine, but again, our finance chair and council members have to have the ability to review all of these and not have them. Mrs. Evans, this is almost identical to Mr. Joyce's amendment, if we, if we just let me finish it. Well, I, I still believe that we should wait until the following week to make all the final amendments. So I wouldn't be approving this. As Even I, though I may agree with it, I won't be approving it. Chief salary, $67,228.11, savings of $16,258.07. City Council, 4010-01.020.000.4010, standard salary, $224,404.50. Legislative legal advisor, full time, $52,500, savings of $7,500. Business Administration. 4010-01.040.000.4010, standard salary, $197,765.75. Business Administrator, $53,550, savings of $10,000. Finance Manager, $37,400, savings of $10,000. Senior Accountant, zero, savings of $37,400. Business Administration, Human Resources, 4010-01.040.000041.4010, standard salary, $104,184.50. HR Director, Pell Coordinator, $36,000, a savings of $10,000. Law Department, 4010, 01.060.000040.4010, standard salary, $153,960.43. City solicitor full time, $52,500, savings of $15,000. Additional expenses, property tax rebate for veterans, $106,158.07. I'll second. Is there anyone on the question? Yes, on the question. Um, this is almost identical actually to what Mr. Joyce um, presented. The only difference is um, with this amendment, the property tax reduction would go specifically for veterans. Um, I'm just going to, again, reiterate that 
I don't believe the votes should be taken this evening. They will be taken next week. All of these amendments will be reviewed, um, regardless of tonight's vote, will be reviewed. And those that are feasible presented next week. And so for that reason, I will be voting no. Now, I just had some questions. The property tax rebate for veterans, would this be a program that would be started or? Um, the state actually, the state of Pennsylvania actually has a similar program. Um, in the state of Pennsylvania, 100% disabled veteran does not have to pay any property taxes. And this is actually an idea that was brought up um, during the CDBG allocations when we were discussing that by a resident um, to have some sort of rebate. And it wouldn't be an entire rebate. Um, by right, judging by, this, be an yeah, rebate judging by the, the Census Bureau figures, um, assuming in excess of 50% of the veterans that live in Scranton are homeowners. Um, that would provide almost half the amount of the, ta with, of the tax increase being rebated back to them. So instead of taxes going up 12% for veterans, it would go up six, approximately. And, and, and also depending on how many took advantage of applying for the program, which could be run as simple as um, presenting discharge papers, which most veterans have. Now, it's, I think it's a very fine idea, but I don't know that it's legal. And so again, I think that the state already has a program. Well, the, the state does, but that doesn't apply to municipalities. So I think we would have to have um, probably both solicitors, but particularly council solicitor, do the research on that before you could approve that. Well, other municipalities do have them, and the state does as well. Well, I still believe that we need to have our legal advisors take a look at it. Okay. I would once again like to make a motion to table the amendments. We have a motion on the floor to table the second set of amendments. Is there a second? I'll second. On the question? Once again, I, I believe that you know, we all have an, a right to, uh, you know, make motions and to present ideas. And, and I think you're right, Mrs. Evans, but I, I, I do believe that we need an opportunity to review these rather than vote on them this evening. And when you were out before, um, I did ask uh, Mr. Joyce if next week when we do the amendments that he had suggested that we read them individually because there are items that at least I would agree with and some that I would disagree with. And, and the same for the amendments presented um, by Mr. Rogan. And I think uh, by utilizing that process, I, I believe that we do more justice to, um, to the budget and to what's equitable. Um, for the coming year and that is the reason why I think it we should table I would just comment on that I, I tend to agree on separating with voting on each one individually but for instance the First Amendment when you have a finite amount that needs to be deducted to eliminate a program eliminate you know some sort of revenue item if parts bits and pieces were amended and bits and pieces weren't then you would wind up with a hole in the budget with the second item um, that would just be you know the amount that we could amend to, to start a program for a tax rebate for veterans, which, which would be great. And um, you know, I'm disappointed that they're not going to be voted through tonight, but I hope they will next week. Um, and I just to I pick just, up on what you were saying, I think you made um, a good point in that um, as you are taking these individually, uh, voting them up and down, what's approved, what is not approved, you're going to be left with um, uh, the task then of formulating what the expenditures will be and what the revenues will be because that must be finalized prior to the final vote. That's why I think it would have been easier amending this week since you have another week to you know go back and forth but we'll, well see how the votes if, are going to go. If we so. did it tonight then it's actually you know then it becomes a done deal without council ever having the opportunity to see it 
So, I, so will this be the policy for all amendments in the future that they're presented to all members a week in advance uh, on all items? Because I, I do agree. If that's how we're going to do it, I'm fine with that. Well, I can only say that this is what we are doing that applies to the budget. And, you know, I really, I don't want to engage in a debate over the rules and procedures of council because there are, there are many and there are many council members who don't abide by them. And so <laughs> is there anyone else on the question? No, oh, I, yes. I just to answer that quickly, I, I think, uh, you know, there are minor situations where we can make amendments that evening, but this, this, this is definitely something that has to be looked at and considered. And as Mrs. Evans said, there are some good, good things in here, good ideas, but, you know, it's the first time my eyes have seen them, and uh, I'm not the mathematician that Mr. Joyce is, so, you know, it would take me some time to, to I, actually review them. I would just say on the first item, there are, you know, some things that definitely need, a, you know, a little bit of a closer look into, but the second is almost the identical motion that Mr. Joyce mentioned, and it just happened to be that we cut the same things. It was with the exception as I, I think I eliminated a position uh, that Mr. Joyce did in and he reduced yeah. attorney who's a salary a little bit more. Um, they're almost identical. But, uh, See, I, don't, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, we already have. Uh, <laughs> while, while it may be a simple, you know, kind of uh, pluses and minuses. Uh, some of those pluses and minuses are things that some I may agree with, some I may disagree with. Uh, again, I do not want to vote on the amendments that you made in their entirety. A and yes, while well, Mrs. Evans said, you know, it may be difficult in working through this as we make amendments and make adjustments, but uh, that's, for want of a better, that's what we're paid for. So. Um, I, I, I think it, we would do more justice to it by allowing time to examine it and um, presenting it next week. If it does take longer to go through, that's fine. Um, but I, I think the suggestions that you made have a better chance of being approved by tabling it and moving it to next week. Well, I hope to hear from everyone on their <laughs> opinions over the next week on, on both amendments. Although just one we have a motion to table. This is the motion to table we're voting on, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. just the motion to table. I, I agree with uh, Councilman McGough that it would be best to vote on these individually because I know uh, just looking at the, the second and first set of amendments, there's the senior accountant position and I know it's a savings of $37,400, but it's also a position that the city is going to apply uh, for a grant to fund. And I have no problem with putting it in if we get a grant. I don't think anyone would. Okay. Let's but, I, but I think that um, we actually have to have the position in order to apply for the grant. So we'd be adding money into the budget on the hopes of a grant. Correct. Okay. Okay, all those, that's all. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it and so moved. That is all for tonight. Thank you. And Mr. Losco, do you have comments or motions tonight? Uh, just a few comments based on, uh, you know, some of what we heard this evening and, and speakers. Um, one thing to jog my memory, um, Mr. Spindler, was asking about the commuter tax and why there was a difference in the first year versus the second. I think Mr. Joyce explained that. I work right now. I don't think any of us were 100% in favor of it, uh, but we do have to get the city back in shape for our residents that we represent. I work with many commuters, so, you know, I don't feel most comfortable at work most of the time, but I think uh, most of them do understand at this point. But one of the things that was posed to me was a misconception, the fact that uh, we have to go to court each year for the uh, approval for the 1%. I think what a lot of people 
believe is that each year it's going to go up another percent. Second year 2 percent, third year 3 percent. I didn't realize that. But the fact is it's a straight 1 percent commuter tax. 1 percent in year 1 if it's approved, 1 percent in year 2 if it's approved, and 1 percent in year 3 if it's approved straight across the board, not 1. And then 1 and 1 is 2. So I just wanted to clarify that. I do find that, uh, you know, we sit here week after week, we listen to everyone's concerns. Naturally, we're not going to please everyone. We could please someone 10 times in a row, and that vote we make that 11th time turns them right against us. It's tough. It's tough being up there, especially when you try to do the right thing for the people you were elected to represent. Um, but I do find it intriguing and upsetting that we do have some of our own residents fighting the, 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 Merc or the uh, commuter tax. And I find that because these same residents, uh, so they, they call for bankruptcy. Well, I think it's been pretty well explained what happens under bankruptcy. Our residents' taxes will nearly double. And that's a fact. Do we want that to happen? No. We've put up with over a decade of reckless borrowing and spending. We've been in office, most of us, for a little under three years. I thought, it, I thought we would have been farther ahead, but we've had a lot of stumbling blocks thrown in front of us. You know, undoing 10 years of damage in three years is pretty tough. One of the residents said, this, you know, how could people, you know, uh, payment in lieu of taxes and, and, and stuff, be willing to donate their money to a city that was mismanaged? And I have to agree. That has been the conception of this city for many years. I would hope that what we've shown in the last couple of years, that that misconception has changed. That someone has taken a bull by the horns. The question was asked to Mr. Joyce, how do you feel, this, will the city be in better shape in 10 years? It's hard to say, but I think all of us here believe it will be based on many of the decisions we've made. If we let it go unabated the way it was, if, if it was business as usual, the proverbial would hit the fan in a few years. We had to tighten our belt. We've had to look at things. I don't think anyone here that wants to run for, for election wanted to raise a penny tax. They know the dire circumstances our city is in. But we didn't want to tax our own residents to death. What I believe, and, and, and I believe our solicitor, our president, and our finance chairman have done probably what some of us have done as parents. When you have a student in college and they run, run their credit card up, they think it's an endless account, as the city has, you take that child by the hand and you correct things, and you work with them to learn where they're going to go in a few years. And I think that's what, what Mrs. Evans, Mr. Joyce, and Mr. Hughes have done with this city administration, especially over the past year. There is a lot of cooperation going on. And it's a case of damned if you do, damned if you don't. We didn't cooperate before. We were chastised for it. When you work with the administration, now we're traitors, we're chastised for it. I know myself, and, and I know these fine people that are with me here. It's in their hearts to do what's best for the 70,000 plus residents of this city. Not any one individual, not any, I don't think anyone on this board has gained individually being on this panel. I know for one, I've lost quite a bit, financially and personally. I do it, and I know they do it, for the love of the people in this city. This is a thankless job. But we're here, we're willing to do it, we're willing to take whatever's thrown at us. But we're going to have to make decisions that aren't popular with everyone. And, uh, you know, we, we, one of the discussions, we get people coming up here, they don't want their taxes increased, they don't want their taxes raised to the dollar, it's going to put them out of their home. 
we come up with ways to generate revenue that's not going to be taxes, and there's people against those ideas. The big one right now on the, on the mark, and it's not a done deal, we're still looking at it, is the towing situation. And to explain the towing situation, the police department does not tow. They have no tow trucks, they will not be towing. There's 15 towers right now that are on a rotational basis that would continue to do the towing. Now I've been called by many of these towers. I'm not going to tell you what I was called, but I've been called by them. I represent 70 some thousand people in this city. I have to do what's best for them. If 15 towers are going to be mad at me because I'm trying to keep the taxes down and generate revenue to do that for the people in this city, then so be it. They still have businesses. They're still towing. There's other towers in this city that have no city business. They're surviving. Mr. Bola said he doesn't do any city towing. He's surviving. Would I love to see them have more business? Yes, I would. This has nothing to do with the individual towers. They are getting a piece of the pie. They're not losing anything. Some other cities do their own towing and impounding. They're still able to do that. And, and there's been a lot of stuff thrown out here about the logistics. We sat down and spoke to the, those policemen that are going to be involved in this, and they as much as assured us that the infrastructure is already in place. There's very little that would have to be done. Police headquarters is open 24 hours a day. They receive ticket fines and fees 24 hours a day. There's nothing for a tower to stop there. The police officer opens the gate, let them in, they drop the car off and go. Drop the paperwork off. It is lighted, it has cameras, the cameras are in the police station, and what better place to protect your vehicles than right at the police department? What better way to know you're paying the same fee as the guy that was towed by ABC towing rather than DEF? That's the way I look at it. I have to look at it as a practical view. I don't think we're putting people out of business. Sometimes you have to add things and, and reinvent yourself. I know. I've done that too. And that's what I step back and look at. We're not trying to privatize or take business from private people. We're trying to knock the taxes down and not hurt your pockets. That's what it's all about. If it wasn't for this panel, we wouldn't have, they wouldn't even have looked at the uh, streets uh, revenue. Plus there's other, there's a ton of ideas that are coming out. And again, you know, this commuter tax, if, if we come up with other avenues of revenue, hopefully, you know, they won't need that next year. I'm not making any promises. But this is an active, proactive panel here looking at ways to make this city what it once was, reduce the taxes, and bring it to where it was. But for those that come here week after week and expect us to make changes overnight, it's not going to happen. And the city, in two, three years, may look the same. But I am confident that in 10 years, what we have done in the last two years and, and going forward will be witnessed. When we're, when we're long gone and done being lambasted by certain individuals, then they're going to realize, you know what? Boy, if they didn't stop that at that time, we'd be a lot worse off than we were. That's the way I feel. But I do believe that uh, anything we could do to generate revenue for this city and we're not taking the whole ball of wax, we're not taking everything out of their pockets. We have to do it. We can't have it both ways. We can't reduce your taxes and take care of everybody else. That's been the innate problem in this city. A lot of people have been taken care of for years with money that could have been dumped back into the city. We all know that. It's hard to prove a lot of it, but we all know that. 
But I'll tell you what, there's new sheriffs in town here, and this is where it's going to be. And I believe that we're doing everything we can to offset any tax increases. And, and, and I have to say, I've been very busy. I've been in some phone conversations with Mrs. Evans and Mr. Joyce, but God bless them. I know the time they've put in on this budget, along with Solicitor Hughes and Mrs. Craig and our office staff. I know that personally. I've been at meetings when I could, and I haven't been able to make half as many as I should have. But they were there. They've done it. I applaud them. It's a tough, daunting task. But I know their hearts are in the same place as mine. Their beliefs are the same as mine. We may not always agree. Probably 99% of the time we do. Maybe a little more than me and my wife agree. But, <laughs> but we're, all in, we're all in the same boat here. We want to see this city thrive. Uh, sometimes other ideas are different and, and, and uh, you know, we, we look at them and everything, but I do feel confident that we do our homework when we make these votes and everyone, for their own individual reason, makes their vote on, on certain issues. But I honestly am going to say I'm representing over 70,000 people. I'm not going to be intimidated by 15 people. Uh, when it comes down to it, that's been the, the, the nature of the beast in this area. You know, there's a lot of influence out there. And uh, I know, but there's nothing more that could be done to me. I'm here for you. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank Mr. you Mr. Lask, Mr. it does affect everyone, though. The, the, if the cars are going to be placed into a city lot, it does affect everyone. And that's what I'm trying to get across, that it's not just about... And it is part, part of it is about the, the businesses. A city should not go after a business. You know, it's, it's one thing when a city has to lay off city employees, which we've done in the past to save money. But it's another thing when a city is going to put out other tax paying businesses. And at the same time, it can hurt other residents who are going to have their vehicles in these lots. I think it's a better situation for the residents knowing where their vehicles are, not going all over town looking for them, and knowing they're under police protection. I said, that's my belief. You could have your belief, and uh, but we're gonna that's have where we're going to differ. We're going to have police officers watching vehicles, which I, I'm sure they'll do more than a fine job of doing it, but I think they'd be better out in, on, the, on the streets. Mr. Mr. Well, Rogan, those police officers are in the building there, right. uh, watching on the cameras in the building. It's right at their headquarters. But I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to get in an argument over this because we do have our differences. But I think taking care of 70 some thousand people right now is more of a benefit than 15, and that's my belief. We have to get our taxes down. We have to get revenue in this city to get us back in shape. And if we don't keep doing these nickel and dime things, they accumulate to hundreds and thousands of dollars. And uh, that's my belief at this point. Um, I'm going to uh, hold my uh, comments this evening until next week because this is a lengthy meeting and we have a very lengthy agenda ahead of us on which to vote. Uh, I just want to say, though, very quickly that I agree with what Mr. Loscombe had to say. Uh, it needed to be said. And your statements are absolutely accurate. Um, I think what we're forgetting about here is let's, let's just, and this is piggybacking what uh, Mr. Loscombe said, let's flip the coin, take a look at the other side of the coin here. Um, what, what's being proposed here? is catering to a special interest group. And that special interest group pumps a lot of money into political campaigns. And I don't think it's right to cater to a special interest group at the expense of all the taxpayers of this city. 
and I know that uh, you know everyone everyone has received calls I would say probably with the exception of me but that's because uh, these individuals like to call my husband instead but they don't call me I've you know also been told that a council member met with them you know but maybe went out to eat with them but the point is again the city's not going to survive if every time you turn around you say no to a new idea a new suggestion that's going to bring in revenue because it's going to hurt a special interest group that's got to stop and um, Mrs. Evans, I, the, I don't want to belabor this. No, but I, no, we're not going to belabor. No, I just want to respond. We're not going to belabor. I just want no, to. No, we're not. I'm responding. going to respond. And Mrs. Evans, what, I'm and going to I, respond. You have interrupted me, and I'm going to finish, and then we're proceeding to the voting portion. Well, then I'll Mr. speak Rogan. on the question on the budget. And uh, when you asked before about motions and the procedure for motions, I think the situations are going to dictate the motions because there are times when there is great urgency when something may be in a seventh order uh, vote and someone notices that something is inappropriate or inaccurate within the language and it has to be changed quickly other times we have tabled things there have been motions proposed in advance and motions, many motions, I know um, uh, you typically, you know, over the last three years, do your motions the same time that you present them. And many of us do. You pass them, up. well, in that case, though, it's it, something it, that's pertaining to the legislation itself. Mrs. Evans, the budget and last been, year, Mr. Joyce did not provide been, a copy to many of us before, been, and, and, and I voted for it. And it's been run through our office. So, you know, I, I don't want to belabor it anymore. It was done last year what in budget amendments, um, and it Mr. was acceptable Mr. then. Mr. Rogan, I don't want to engage in this grandiose debate of, I know you are, we're but We're a deliberative what, body. That's what we're here I to do. I know you are, but what am I? It's over. I am the chairman of rules. You are. And it is over. You are the chairman. And Woman. Mrs. Craig? Sale of a $14 million principal amount, tax anticipation note of the City of Scranton, known as TAN Series 2013A, awarded to Amalgamated Bank, determining the form and term of said note, awarding said note authorizing and directing the filing of certain documents and directing the proper officials of the city of scranton to take any and all other actions as may be required in connection with the issuance of said note at this time i'll entertain a motion that item 5b be introduced into its proper committee so moved second on the question uh, I just wanted to present some of the information regarding the TAN. $14 million is the principal amount. 4.95% is the annual interest rate. Um, from January 2013 through June 2013, Amalgamated will retain 55% of the earned income tax and 45% of the EIT is returned to the city on a daily basis from July 2013 until the obligation is paid in full 70% will be forwarded to amalgamated and 30% of said revenue will be forwarded to the city each business day is there anyone else on the question all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Sixth order, 6A, reading by title, file of council number 76, 2012, an ordinance. An ordinance providing for the regulation and control of stormwater management in the city of Scranton where the Lackawanna River watershed pursuant to Pennsylvania's Stormwater Management Act 
Act 167 as amended by providing for the approval of stormwater plans, providing standards and methodologies for the design of stormwater controls, the administration of this ordinance by the City of Scranton, <coughs> and penalties for the violation of this ordinance. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. Second. On the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6B, reading by title, file of council number 77, 2012, in ordinance, appropriating funds for the expenses of the city government for the period commencing on the first day of January, 2013, to and including December 31st, 2013, by the adoption of the general city operating budget for the year 2013. You've heard reading by title of item 6B. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6B pass reading by title. Second. On the question. Yes, on the question. Um, I would just like to respond regarding the accusation of political donations that Mrs. Evans made. You could check my campaign finance reports every time I ran if it was directed at me. I have never accepted a dime from any of the towers. It wasn't directed at you. The contributions that I was referring to were given to the mayor during his campaigns for various offices. Is there anyone else on the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. I apologize. No. Okay. That's a no vote. I believe the ayes have it and so moved. I thought we were on 6A. My apologies. That's all right. 6C. Reading by title, file of council number 78, 2012, an ordinance approving fee schedule for delinquent tax searches, delinquent and current refuse searches, and lien condemnation searches. You've heard reading by title of item 6C. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6C pass reading by title. Second. Second. On the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it and so moved. 6D, reading by title, file of council number 79, 2012, in ordinance, repealing all prior ordinances regarding fines to be imposed for police and fire departments' responses to false alarms in the city, establishing fines to be imposed for the activation of an alarm device which is determined to be false alarm by the police department or fire department, authorizing the administration and enforcement of said fines, and prescribing penalties for violations of this ordinance. You've heard reading by title of item 6D. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6D pass reading by title. Second. On the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Seventh Order 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Public Works for adoption, file of Council number 74, 2012, authorizing the vacation of an unopened right-of-way known as the 200 block of McDonough Street, consisting of an area 150 feet long between 39.31 and 39.62 feet wide, located between Gregg Court, undeveloped, and Colliery Avenue in the city of Scranton is more particularly described in the legal description and map attached hereto, under and subject to a permanent easement and right-of-way granted to the sewer authority of the city of Scranton, Pennsylvania, over the entire vacated area. What is the recommendation of the chair for the Committee on Public Works? As chair for the Committee on Public Works, I recommend final passage of item 7A. Second. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. 7B, for consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption, file of council number 75, 2012, an ordinance to provide revenue for the city of Scranton by imposing a tax upon the privilege of attending or engaging in amusements, including every form of entertainment, diversion, sport, recreation, and pastime, 
requiring all persons, partnerships, associations, and corporations conducting places of amusements, imposing duties and conferring powers upon the treasurer of the city of Scranton, prescribing the method and manner of collecting the tax imposed by this ordinance, and imposing penalties for the violation thereof. I make a motion to amend item 7B as per the following changes. One, in the now therefore clause, delete 10% and insert 5%. Two, in section 5A, student activities on the third line after public schools, insert and private schools, and after public school districts, insert and private school districts. Number three, in section 7A, delete 10% and insert 5%. Second. On the question. Yes, uh, thank you for the amendments uh, to include private schools. I think it's, uh, it's an equitable thing to do. Yes, that's a oh, No problem. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor of the motion to amend item 7B signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. What is the recommendation of the chair for it? the committee? Was there a second on it? Oh, second. second. I don't get yeah. on the original motion, I think. He to amend? No, no. I, my fault. I, we I think voted now to amend. Yeah, so now we're going back to the original. I know. No. Okay. What is the recommendation of the chair for the Committee on Finance? As chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of 7B as amended. Second. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 I hereby declare item 7B as amended, legally and lawfully adopted. 7C, for consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption, resolution number 52, 2012, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a supplemental reimbursement agreement, number 041222-C, with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the purpose of increasing the funds allocated for the design of the Rockwell Avenue Bridge Project and updating various exhibits relating to same. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Finance? As Chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of item 7C. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 I hereby declare item 7C legally and lawfully adopted. <laughs> 7D, for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for adoption, resolution number 53, 2012, ratifying and approving of the execution and submission of the grant application by the City of Scranton to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, acting through the Commonwealth Financing Authority for a local share account grant pursuant to the Pennsylvania Racehorse Development and Gaming Act in the amount of $2,044,000 in support of the City of Scranton paving project throughout the City of Scranton, Pennsylvania, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to accept the grant, if successful, coordinating and dispersing the grant funds for the City of Scranton paving project. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Community Development? As Chair for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 70. Second. On the question. Yes, I think uh, there should uh, we should commend the work that uh, Sandy Opshinsky did on obtaining this um, grant, which uh, is so severely needed uh, for paving in the city. Yes, in fact, I sent her an email expressing just that. Uh, anyone else on the question? Roll call, please. Mr. Goff? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. I hereby declare item 7D legally and lawfully adopted. Uh, a point of, of interest, Mrs. Evans, I just wanted to verify that we did do roll call on 7B. And 
and C. And I just wanted to verify with Ms. Marciano if she does have roll call answers for each of the seventh order items. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seven E, for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for adoption, resolution number 54, 2012, amending resolution number 45, 2012, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials for the city of Scranton to enter into a loan agreement and make a loan from the Community Development Block Grant Loan Program, project number 150.34, in an amount not to exceed $150,000 to Freckles and Frills Incorporated to assist an eligible project to include the guarantee of Early Development Associates, LLC. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Community Development? As Chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7E. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 I hereby declare item 7E legally and lawfully adopted. Uh, before we conclude tonight, I'd like to wish everyone in our Jewish community a very blessed and happy Hanukkah. And I ask everyone to remember our servicemen and women who gave the ultimate sacrifice at Pearl Harbor as we celebrate tomorrow National Pearl Harbor Recognition Day. If there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. It doesn't, it's not required, but we can do it. And before we adjourn, we can actually allow anyone. Is there anyone who would like to comment? Okay. And if there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. And if you want to dry the seeds, you could roast the seeds and eat the seeds, or you could.